All right. Mr. Mike is here. I think he was just passing his donuts around. <laughs> Have a donut. You too. Morning, Sai. Morning, Judy. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Great. Hey, I miss not seeing you. <laughs> we got a beautiful day. Yes, thank you. That is. Two, I think they're saying. Ooh, magic. Yeah. Good morning, Dr. Lowry. Good morning, Ron. How are you? Still alive. <laughs> <laughs> you look good. <laughs> Thanks, Sai. How do you like retirement? You know what? It's it's, uh, it's great, actually. I'm very busy with everything, and uh, yeah, it's all good. Morning, everyone. Morning, Your Worship. All right. It uh, Rogers tells me it is now nine o'clock, and uh, we are going to start our meeting. And uh, before we do that. Uh, this is the initial uh, broadcast for YouTube of our council and committee meetings, and I would like to welcome those of the public that are um, tuning in and uh, watching this committee meeting, and we welcome you to our committee meeting today. So uh, you can watch it either on YouTube directly or through our website. All right, uh, well, there'll be a call to order then, and uh, disclosure of pecuniary interest in IC member costs. Yes, I have a, a pecuniary interest on D2.2, the Royal Canadian Legion, as I'm a Legion member. Okay, that's okay. And, uh, member Thank you. Through, through the chair, I also have a, a conflict on D2.2, as I am a member of the Coldwater Legion as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Those two have been declared. Any others? If, Mr. Chair, if I can just ask everyone to make sure they keep their microphones muted unless they're talking, that would be great. Thank, thank you, uh, Allison. All right, we're going to delegations this morning, and uh, please be advised that in accordance with the Council's procedural bylaw, no decision will be made this morning on the delegations. The will do one of the following. A, refer the matter to staff for a report. B, refer the matter to future budget deliberation. Or C, take the direction. And uh, Madam Clerk, I assume that uh, uh, Inspector Dayton is standing by. Uh, he actually has not yet joined us, Mr. Chair. So perhaps we could start with the uh, Mariposa House Hospice and come back to him when he joins us. Yes, that is. Uh, Totally doable. All right, let me uh, welcome uh, to our meeting today, Annalise and uh, Dr. Sai, with regard to uh, Mariposa Hospice. And uh, we'll turn the meeting over to you and let you make your presentation. Good morning. Okay, here we go. Share, that's good. And we'll one second. Mm -hmm. Okay, hopefully, can everybody see the slide, the first yeah. slide? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much uh, for uh, having us uh, present this morning. It's always an incredible pleasure to present to uh, the, the Mayor and Council of Severn. Uh, this morning, Annalise and I have two uh, purposes. One is to give you our latest update on the uh, hospice 
And the other is to uh, make a request for some short-term funding. And uh, so uh, without further ado, we'll change slides here. Everybody knows uh, where we are. And, uh, but the aerial view is always interesting to look at. Uh, and the uh, closest uh, public transportation is near the brick there for buses and, okay. So I think you all know this story well, um, but obviously uh, I'll just quickly go through the fact that uh, Severn Aurelia and the surrounding townships have needed uh, our hospice for residential care for many years. And uh, as of 2020, we were the only area in this region without one, meaning Simcoe. Uh, home and community care has been stretched beyond its capacity uh, to provide in-home palliative care, especially end of life. And that, had, by the way, is, has not gotten any better. Uh, but we are very involved in planning with the new Ontario Health Team here in Aurora, the Kuchiching one. Uh, families experience tremendous burnout, and that's what's uh, so uh, satisfying is to see the feedback and wonderful relief that people get when they come in here. And uh, hospitals obviously are trying to end hallway medicine. So our story, as you know, uh, it's about five years long, from 2016 to 2021, going through the various stages of getting our charitable number, getting our, our name uh, you know, properly recorded, and uh, getting support from the LIN for uh, operational funds, which is approximately 50% of your, uh, your annual budget. And we were very successful by 2020, we had completed our uh, fundraising of 3.5 million for the capital campaign, also with help from uh, Severn Township to the tune of $50,000. And uh, we accepted our first patients, uh, on, I say patient, <laughs> I'm supposed to say client. Anyway, our first residents uh, were February 12th and uh, we have been basically, uh, you know, full of capacity ever since. And when you look at this time frame, uh, we just had a meeting with the head of the uh, Hospice Association of Ontario, and he said there's uh, two big hospices, for instance, in Ontario that were approved in 2005 and still aren't even close to breaking ground. So we did it lightning fast, according to the Ministry of Health. And at Collingwood took over 10 years. We accomplished the same thing in five, um, and, uh, and we're proud of that. So uh, this is just some nice pictures. You, we all know that we do have 2.4 acres, which allows us room to expand and room for the um, walkway through the forest and the gardens. Uh, this is our groundbreaking picture. And, uh, and you saw that our old sign is now replaced with a beautiful new lighted sign. And there's the board on the upper left in August. So that's 2019, which most of you attended that, uh, that session. It was a, just a wonderful moment. And then January, you can see the building is taking shape. And by May, despite COVID and all the delays, uh, it's looking like it's getting some siding. And then uh, by October, 2020, we had finished construction. And that's just to show that we live in Aurelia. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Annalise. Great, thanks, Sai. And uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks again to Mayor and Council for um, allowing us to share this update today. I hope you can hear me okay. Everything is fine. Perfect. So as I was saying, opening in February was a major step forward for Severn, Aurelia, and the surrounding communities. Um, one of the key highlights is that the care provided here is close to home. Prior to our opening, people had to drive 30 to 45 minutes if they wanted their loved one to receive end of life care in a hospice setting. Um, so the, the care offered here in this home-like setting is offered by a team of nurses and personal support workers that have specialized palliative care training and they're here 24 seven. We don't charge for our services, but we do rely on our community to support the hospice financially. And we'll be talking more about that a little bit later in this presentation. So just to take you on a wee tour again, I know many of you have either been here or seen the online tour that we've done, but just to highlight that there are many thoughtful features about the design of the residential hospice. The resident rooms are very spacious. Um, each one has a small terrace or patio where the resident can enjoy some fresh air. 
in their hospital bed or in a wheelchair. The Murphy beds also allow for overnight stays right beside the resident. Down the hall, we have a spa room with a large therapeutic bathtub, which is an amazing way to offer care to our residents. And there's a walk-in shower room used for bathing when the resident is able. We have a gorgeous family room with a stone fireplace and a spacious kitchen with a beautiful harvest table. And outdoors, we have a barbecue area, a gazebo, various gardens, and a walking path down through the forested area behind the building. Here we have a few photos. Top left shows our reception area with a plaque recognizing our capital donors, including Severn Township. Top right shows our kitchen area. Bottom left is our nursing station. And the bottom right shows one of our resident rooms with a view of the forest. And here we thought we'd showcase some of our friendly neighbors. We're still talking about that moose to this day. <laughs> that was about six months ago. So eligibility and access. Uh, the main eligibility requirement for admission to hospice is that a person be diagnosed with a life-limiting illness and have a life expectancy of less than three months. But the average length of stay is days to weeks. The intent is to provide support in the final stages and to offer comfort, manage symptoms, and enhance quality of life. In our first seven months, a conservative estimate is to say that we have supported over 200 people in addition to the 66 and actually now over 70 individuals that have been our residents. The impact of what we're doing here is not difficult to imagine. For anyone who's experienced the loss of a loved one, you can probably imagine what a powerful experience it is to arrive here and know that your loved one is going to be cared for by a dedicated team in a safe and comfortable setting and that you can be there with them at any time for as long as you wish. Sometimes when we meet family members for the first time, I can almost see the weight being lifted from their shoulders. The environment we're in, both the building and the grounds outside, has an impact all, in, all on its own. Residents, family members, friends, as well as staff, volunteers and community members are all welcome to come and enjoy the serenity of our garden area and forest path. And serene is the word that people use to describe it quite often. We also wanted to highlight that we're an employer of 22 individuals, most of whom live locally. And we are grateful to have close to 30 volunteers helping with the day-to-day -day operations, not to mention gardening volunteers, a fundraising committee, and a volunteer board of directors. We included some testimonials here uh, for a moment, I'll just, for the moment, I'll just pull out um, a short quote from the middle one. This person thanks us for the exceptional care and compassion shown to her husband, saying that he was able to spend time with his son and daughter and his grandkids, which meant so much to all of us. And this often follows the care that we provide to residents is, is a, a, a thank you from the family explaining what it meant to them. So we do rely on our community to make the residential hospice possible. These are just a few examples of how our community supports us. And I'll just turn it back to Sai for a couple of slides. Okay, do you want to change it? <clears throat> Thanks, Annalise. So when we look at funding, uh, our annual operating costs are basically uh, over a million dollars per year. Uh, the Ministry of Health funding for five beds is 525 per year. You get 125,000 per year per bed, and that goes 100% uh, towards uh, clinical costs, which is uh, staff, basically, our uh, RNs, RPNs, and PSWs. So we had uh, have had expected a shortfall of 600,000 per year, uh, which has to be raised within our local community, and uh, Annalise is calculated it works out to approximately $50,000 per month or $300 per resident per day. So the Ministry of Health grossly underfunds these beds even though it saves the Ministry of Health a lot of money when they're not in hospital and provides better care in a home-like setting close to home. So it's not uh, like nobody can really justify this shortfall and that's why so many places don't have a residential hospice uh, even to this day. So fundraising events and programs, we have lots of special events. We're now launched the angel tree again for people to buy uh, ornaments uh, and that goes till Christmas. 
We had a very successful culinary night in the spring, and we're going to do that again. We had a successful uh, golf tournament in August, and we have hiked for hospice every spring, and we share the proceeds from that with uh, Hospice Aurelia, the community program. So we have ongoing initiatives. The Butterfly Club is one we always like to promote. Uh, people sign up for planned giving either on a monthly, six monthly or annual basis. Um, and that's been very successful at other hospices and, and it's building steam here, but it takes time. We have beautiful paintings in the uh, hospice now that are donated by local artists. And then it, they actually are for sale and we've sold one already. Uh, it's been purchased and the artists uh, donate the entire proceeds to the hospice. So we've got beautiful paintings here by lots of local artists, the most recent from Will McGarvey and also one from Charles Pachter. So uh, we're working on some pretty uh, impressive artists. Patio stone engraving is going well. If anybody has seen them, they're just lovely and that'll keep going. So the big component that we don't have uh, rolling uh, as much as we need yet, and this is the biggest component for all hospices, is uh, in memoriams and bequests. Now we are receiving donations um, and often they seem to come out of the blue, which is wonderful. Uh, but when you look at in memoriams and bequests, the bequests in particular are a large part of hospice income on a, uh, at other places. And they take time to develop. We have been named in three wills that I know of, but as you all are aware, and our accountant and uh, business uh, board members tell us, it's two years before you see that money. So even in the best of situations, it's two years, but as Annalise will detail, uh, there are some significant delays and this is our hardest time in the next two years. Annalise. So just um, as we wind up our presentation, our, our request really circles around or, or is based on what Sai was just talking about. We know from um, the experience of other hospices, it does take 18 to 24 months for a new residential hospice to fully develop revenue streams to an adequate level. So you saw on the previous slide, we're doing all wonderful things to raise the, the funding, but it does take time. And COVID-19 has certainly lengthened that time frame because it's affected how all charities and nonprofits do their fundraising. So our association is working with the provincial government to adjust the funding formula so that we do get more of our core operational expenses covered. That is in the works behind the scenes, but that also takes time. It takes four to six budget cycles to see any changes implemented that our association is advocating for. Um, so we're asking the Severn Township to consider providing some short-term operational funding support of 25,000 per year for two years to help us bridge that gap and get us through to the point where we're fully sustainable with all of these various fundraising initiatives that we're undertaking. Uh, it's our intent not to ask for this type of operational funding again. It really is due to the extenuating circumstances of opening in the middle of a global pandemic and uh, trying to get everything up to speed. Thanks, Annalise. So we'll go back to the regular Zoom, I think. Sure. And if we can, and hopefully that'll, yeah, there we are, great. So uh, as you can see, this is, uh, it's always a tough time for every hospice the first two years, but it has been uh, aggravated by circumstances. And that's why we're asking for some help. So we're open for any kind of questions and uh, hopefully enjoyed the, uh, the update. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sai and uh, Annalise uh, for that presentation. And I will open it to the committee for questions. I, the first one I see is Member Burkett. Thank you through the chair and thank you to both of you for a wonderful presentation and thank you for everything that you do. Have you approached other, like have you approached the city of Aurelia or Oro with the same presentation or are you planning to? Yes, so we have, um, we presented to City Council uh, of Aurelia uh, just uh, two weeks ago. Uh, so uh, they, uh, we asked them for 50,000 per year for two years. And uh, it was unanimous, including the mayor, that they support this request. And it has gone to budget. And I've heard from budget that, um, that they're, you know, seriously considering, but uh, obviously it has to go through the, the, the budget committee. Uh, and other, other townships we haven't approached yet, 
Um, Oro Madadi is still uh, contributing 12,500 per year for two more years uh, as part of our capital campaign. So, and uh, so we will approach other communities though. Thank you very much, doctor. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, hand I saw was member Dunlop. Unmute there. Thank you. Through the chair. Uh, morning, Dr. Sai and Annalise. And by the way, I love your name, Annalise. Uh, thank you for this update. <laughs> it's always nice to know um, where you were and where we're going to. And you've done a lot of work in record time and congratulations for that. I have a really close friend that works in the Midland one. And mm -hmm. she says, every time people look at her, they go, she's coming for money. So it's it's a hard go and I understand fundraising is mm. is hard to do right now, but it sounds like you have a lot of ideas that are interesting and in going forward. Um, I'm totally for hospice. I think it's a great option that people can have, but I'm gonna be the elephant in the room and ask you, is there any um, thought in going forward that people will be charged some sum of money? Well, I'll let Annalise answer that. Sure, yeah, no, there isn't. It's part of the residential hospice model and part of our provincial standards that hospice care is not a fee for service. Okay, I just worry about you going forward. But anyway, I would support this and I would like it to see go to budget um, in November. So thanks again. Have a good day and good job. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, that's great. I think, um, you know, ideally, they should fully fund this service because it's uh, it is an essential service. Uh, but um, it seems it comes close to, to that point many times over the last number of years, and then it just um, it just doesn't happen. So I'm not holding my breath, and uh, and but we are going to work very hard, and we will make our our goals hopefully with your support too. Thank you very much for everything you do. Thank you, uh, Member Dunlop. Uh, Member Taylor. Yeah, just a question and a comment. Uh, yes. So roughly how many, the percentage breakdown do you think come from the different areas? Like say, I'm just curious how many do come from Severn and just uh, curious and then I have a comment after. Yes, Annalise. Um, actually, I'd have to get back to you on that. Um, I don't know off the top of my head the breakdown on who's coming from Severn and who's coming from Aurelia. I do know that when you look at our area as a whole, and we're part of the Kuchiching Ontario Health Team. So I do track how many are local and how many are from farther afield. And so I, my guesstimate is probably around 90 to 95% of the people being admitted live in the Kuchiching area, but I haven't split out how many are specifically have a Severn address. So I'd have to get back to you on that. Okay, that'd be great. And just in closing, uh, I, uh, this is a very valuable service and I appreciate all the work that you have done there. And uh, I certainly would support this going to budget as well. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Member Taylor and Member Cox. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Cy and Kat. <laughs> And Annalise, um, yeah, this is this is wonderful that we need this, and uh, I too would uh, support it going to budget if that's what we need to do. But I was wondering through the chair to um, our CAO, is this something we can do now, or should we send it to budget? Uh, I believe it uh, is going to be received for information today and sent to budget. That that's my uh, understanding. Uh, Member uh, McIntyre was next. I, w I was kind of asking Lori, sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, through the chair to um, uh, everyone involved. I've had a loved one go through hospice and it's a, it's a huge relief to the family to have someone mm -hmm. uh, very close to you go through this and I'm four square behind it, 100%. And then, thank you very much. And uh, Member Stevens was next. You have to unmute yourself, Member Stevens. Just hold the space bar down, Member Stevens. How's that? Is that better? Yes, that's okay. good. Okay, I, uh, quite frankly, I'm surprised we're even here. I mean, a simple letter from Dr. Lowry uh, would have been uh, enough because we know that uh, no matter how hard we try, 
to raise funds to an exact amount, it always call, falls a little short. So uh, from my point of view, uh, it, it, we need to do this, and I, I, I ask my other members of council to, to, to follow along as well. We, we, we have to do it. Let's get on with it. Thank, thank you, uh, Member Stevens. Uh, Member Cox. Yeah, sorry, I forgot. Uh, through the chair to uh, Dr. Lowry, you know, if there's ever anything we can do to help you appeal to the government to have this uh, change to essential, you just need to let us know if you need anything because we would, I know we all would be very happy to help. That's that's a good idea. What do you think, Annalise? Uh, is there there's timing on that, I suppose. Yeah, there's yes. certainly a lot of provincial conversations happening between mm -hmm. our association and the provincial government. So that's something we can uh, discuss and get back to you if there's uh, if there's ever a need. Thank okay, you. thank you. Any uh, further comments by the committee? Uh, seeing none, uh, uh, Allison, do we have a motion, please? Absolutely. So the delegation um, by Ms. Stenix, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, um, and Dr. Lowry, regarding an update from Mariposa House Hospice, you received in that their budget request be referred to the 2022 budget for consideration. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have a mover of that? Uh, that's uh, Member Taylor. A seconder is Member McIntyre. All in favor? And that has passed, uh, Madam Clerk. And uh, once again, let me thank the two of you for your presentation. And uh, you will be hearing from us after we go through the budget process. And thank you again for your presentation. Well, thank thanks you so much for thank, having us. Thanks for having us. Have a great day. Okay, bye-bye. Mr. Chair, I do believe Inspector Yeatman has joined us at this point. Thank you. Uh, we'll return to item uh, C1 then which is the OPP quarter update. And uh, welcome, Inspector Yakeman. And uh, we uh, were waiting to hear from you. Uh, please uh, go ahead and make your presentation. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you. So just uh, with respect to the quarter three, July, August, September, uh, with respect to motor vehicle, uh, casual factors, collisions, um, we set pretty much the uh, the same as we were this time last year, 2020. We had the one fatal up on Upper Big Chute Road at the uh, train crossing. Um, property damage has gone up a little bit, and um, but uh, non-fatal personal injury is down. I do note that um, uh, for the non-fatal personal injury, impaired driving is slowly creeping up again. So. Um, increased in ride uh, checks will be occurring, of course, with uh, our typical um, Christmas campaigns and that sort of aspect, but uh, that's one thing to note. When we get uh, to respect to our um, uh, Police Service Board report and uh, with, with crime statistics, uh, we're looking in really good shape for July through September. Uh, you know, there was a slight increase in fraud um, uh, uh, fraud occurrences, which uh, uh, were right across the board, unfortunately. Um, not Your township was not uh, unique or uh, with that aspect. Uh, several credit card frauds, uh, some online uh, frauds, some vacation and rental uh, scam frauds. So those were on the increase. Um, on another note, we uh, issued 106 provincial offense notices uh, during the third quarter. We conducted uh, four focused patrols, um, which we typically do uh, only one a month. Uh, we ended up doing uh, two in the month of September, which included uh, during the day we were focused on school zones. And in the evening we were focused um, uh, on Muskoka Street in Wishago for some uh, break and enters and, and thefts that had been occurring from vehicles uh, in the summertime. So we were uh, in that area. July, um, we were on Division Road. Uh, and in August, we were on Upper Big Shoot Road were the, were the areas that we focused on for our focus patrols. Uh, for this quarter, we had uh, 25 and a half hours of foot patrol. Um, we conducted nine uh, ride uh, occurrences or ride checks uh, during that time. Um, and barring any questions, that uh, concludes my report. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Inspector Aitman. I'm going to go back to the committee now for any comments or questions that you have. Is there any? Uh, yes, Member Taylor. Yeah, I'd asked a couple of these questions in advance, Inspector, and whether you had some answers for them. And the first one is, um, if the OPP were in fact notified of the road closing on Upper Big Shoot Road at the railway crossing just before uh, Severn Falls? That's my first question. So we were um, on the 19th of October, um, and it would have been somewhere in the evening. We were notified through our communication center, uh, but the road was already closed at that time. So we had uh, sent an email out to our detachment members because um, <laughs> the, the to access that area, it's quite a detour for us. Uh, yes, Member Turner. Yeah, yeah, just for the record, it was closed at 8 a.m. on the 19th. So so we, I think we're, we're doing a follow up on what we can do better, if anything, in the future. And then uh, the second question I had is that it's a chronic problem with uh, uh, dirt bikes uh, originating from Tower Line, which is a private road, and they're going crazy at the north end of uh, Irish Line, and it's driving havoc for the residents there, uh, the noise and the safety, and there's a lot of stunt driving with bikes, and I'm hoping that uh, don't forget that area of the township. Uh, absolutely, and those, you know, dirt bikes are, are similar to ATVs or similar to, uh, you know, all other uh, motor vehicles. They've got to be plated if they're on the on the roadways, and uh, so that will be an area of focus for, for ourselves to ensure that we uh, were there. Uh, I'm not sure how much longer the dirt bikes will occur. Obviously, the snow is going to fly here very shortly, but uh, it is on our radar. Uh, yeah, through the chair, uh, thank you for your comments, and I Look forward to seeing you more out there too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, back to the committee. Any other comments? Uh, seeing none. Uh, Inspector Yateman, thank you for your presentation here today. Uh, we know that speed and uh, is a major concern in our township, as it is in all areas, and uh, it seems that when we spend money to improve roads, then the speed goes up. And uh, either that or you get the complaints on the roads. But uh, being uh, saying that, uh, we thank you for your uh, vigilance and uh, we look forward to your next report. Thank you very kindly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, um, Allison, do we have a, a motion, please? Uh, we do. So the motion reads that the delegation by Inspector Aitman regarding the OPP third quarter update be received for information. Uh, do we have a mover on that? Uh, that is uh, Member Stevens. We have a seconder. Member Taylor, all in favor? And uh, Madam Clerk, that is passed. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, we are moving on then to our consent agenda, which runs from D1.1 right through to D2.2. And I'm going to ask if there is a member that wishes to pull an item. And the first one I saw was uh, member Dunlop and then member Taylor. Through the chair, I'd like to pull D2.2, Coldwater Legion, Read Poppy Remembrance Campaign, please. Thank you, and member Taylor. Yeah, through the chair, uh, D1.6, please. Those are the uh, two. Uh, any others? Don't see any. So we'll go to the uh, uh, consent agenda and adoption of regular agenda, Madam Clerk. Uh, thank you. So the motion will read that the agenda be adopted, including consent items, with the exception of items D1.6 and D2.2. Thank you very much. And we have a mover on that. Uh, member Cox, uh, seconder, member Dunlop, all in favor. And uh, that has passed. Thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. Um, so we'll come back to those uh, as we deal with our agenda. Um, reports from officials. Uh, the first one is F.1.1. Recreation and facilities, and uh, I would just ask who is going to be speaking to that. Through the chair, I will uh, take the lead on that. <clears throat> you, uh, Derek, uh, go ahead. 
Thank you. Through the chair, yes, this is a uh, a beloved bylaw truck that we inherited as a recreation truck asset. Um, has uh, met its end of days, or at least we believe so. Uh, there has been uh, a forecast for replacement in 2022 anyway, and so staff are requesting that this asset be accelerated to replace in the fall, uh, early winter 2021. Thank you very much. Any comments from the committee? Uh, yes, Member Burkett. Through the chair to Mr. Burke, what are we doing with the old truck? So through the chair, um, most assets when we trade uh, fleet assets are offered for trade. So they will be offered for trade to the uh, successful respondent. However, if the tree does not meet our expectations for trade value, we will auction it. Thank you. You know what that converter is worth on the truck, Mr. Burke? Just so you know, thank you. Thank you. All right, member Dunlop. Through the chair to Derek. Are we gonna be able to get a truck? <laughs> Through, through the chair, uh, yes, uh, supply chains are are, uh, are a problem. However, the earlier we go out to procurement, the earlier we'll have the replacement asset. Uh, we do expect a delay in delivery. Okay, so if further to that, if this truck is in such bad condition as the report says, are we just gonna nurse it along till we can get one? Through the chair, no, the truck is uh, is going to be out of commission. And so what, what that means is we'll have to uh, use some of our fleet resources from other areas, and then we'll be in a deficit position for a short while. Um, we'll manage, but uh, the sooner we get the truck on order, the sooner it comes for replacement. Good. Thanks for that information. Okay, uh, any further comments from the committee? Uh, seeing none, Madam Clerk. Thank you. So the motion reads that Recreation Report R21-037 dated October 27th, 2021 with respect to Recreation Fleet Replacement be received. And further that staff be authorized to replace AO2 late duty pickup truck immediately. And further that the purchase be included as mid-year addition to the 2021 capital budget with funds being drawn from the Capital Reserve Fund. Thank you very much. Do we have a mover on that? We have Member Cox, a seconder, Member uh, McIntyre. All in favor? And that uh, has passed, Madam Clerk. Thank you. And we move now to uh, F2.1. Uh, and uh, that's some, um, let me see here, just excuse me. <clears throat> yeah, 2.1. Um, and who's speaking to this? Uh, Derek is back on. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yes, thank you. Through the chair. Um, and actually, I'm going to ask Alex, um, our new public works technologist, to join me. Um, Alex is uh, our newest hire in the public works department and uh, is taking the lead on some of these technical um, type of projects. So Alex will introduce the report and is ready for questions. Welcome, Alex. Thank you. Um, so this one's for uh, our fleet asset management solution. Basically, what we have right now is uh, a filing cabinet system for keeping track of maintenance and service on our fleet, uh, vehicles and uh, snow plows and all the other equipment that we have. Um, we're looking to bring this on digitally to help kind of keep track of everything. I uh, put an RFI out back in late August and uh, had quite a few people or companies respond. Um, what the majority of them offer is a system that centralizes everything so we can put in the uh, the intervals that we need uh, for service and maintenance and it'll automatically pop up to on, on the mechanic system to let them know hey this vehicle here needs uh, maintenance coming up um, so they can plan accordingly um, the system that we are opting for uh, we already have in place for uh, the, uh, the Treasury Department, um, they basically just are going to open up the maintenance side of their pr platform for us. Um, it, uh, it benefits us in that everything basically stays in one location rather than having multiple suppliers um, or providers for the service. Um, so the township can basically talk to itself on, you know, the asset management side of things. Um, the initial or the cost to set this up for the first year is going to be about 35,000 um, 
that's for onboarding and everything. And then the cost annually after that is in the seven thousand <clears throat> seventy five hundred range. And I think that's it for the report, Derek. Unless you got anything else you want to add? Thank you, Alex. Um, seeing uh, none, um, I I'm just looking uh, at the figures shown in the uh, in your report, and uh, I see seventeen thousand four, but that's that's an over budget. That's not the total cost. Is that correct? Yes, uh, Derek. Yes, that's correct. There, the project budget for the year was ten thousand. And so what we have is uh, is an over budget request as well. Now the direction that we've given uh, or we've received from Treasury is actually there's some outstanding and non allocated uh, modernization funding from the previous grant. And this is exactly where that grant uh, uh, best lives is modernizing the way we manage this large fleet of assets. Um, so we're applying that or we're, we're uh, recommending that we apply the uh, the overage as uh, part of the modernization funding we've already received. Thank you, uh, Member Cox. <clears throat> I unmute yourself, Member Cox. Spacebar. Through the chair to Alex. Um, Alex, does this type of um, technical information help? Uh, extend the longevity of life of the vehicle, having everything done at the appropriate times and looking after it? Uh, through the chair, uh, for sure. Um, if, if having, you know, with, with it popping up on the mechanics window, seeing that this vehicle is coming up for service soon, it allows him to keep an eye on the mileage of it or the timing of it and bring it in earlier than the needs to. And, you know, with proper maintenance per, you know, the, the manufacturer's suggested schedule, it, it will help with the longevity. Okay, thank you. And further to that, through the chair to, is Mr. Plunkett here? Uh, Mr. Plunkett, are you uh, online? There he is. I am, Mr. Chair. Hi. Um, how much is left in the modernization after we take the 17-4 out? Just a question, please. Uh, so approximately, uh, once we take out the seventeen thousand five hundred, there's about twenty-two thousand dollars left. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments? I would have expected maybe a comment from our auto specialist, but uh, <laughs> we don't have one. So yes, uh, Member Burkett. To the chair. I think it's a great idea. Like we have different drivers that are using the different trucks. This at least gives uh, Alex and Derek some idea when, in case they forget, these are large vehicles that need to be serviced regularly and they're on the roads all the time. So I think it's a great idea and they can track it. Thank you very much, uh, Member Burkett. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, motion please. Certainly. So the motion reads the public works report number W21-041 dated October 27th, 2021. With respect to fleet asset management solution be received and further that single source procurement for the purchase of fleet asset management solution be accepted. And further that the response received by PSD for fleet management service be accepted in the amount of 26,900 plus HST. And further that the budget deficiency be funded from the modernization reserve fund. Thank you very much. Do we have a mover on that? We have uh, Member Dunlop and uh, Member Stevens seconded and all in favor. Um, Madam Clerk, that is passed. Thank you. We move then now to uh, F2.2. And uh, who is speaking? Uh, where Derek is back on the start of our show. Go ahead, Derek. Thank you, and through the chair. Um, so this is uh, just an introduction to a new telecom company that uh, is seeking to occupy a bit of the north, um, uh, I guess, Bushago area, Ward 5. And um, I'm wondering if the clerk might be able to share a map that will kind of highlight the service area. Um, while I describe the next process, it's uh, 
what Kojiko needs to do to even begin to service Severn um, is to apply for and enter into a municipal access agreement. And that agreement protects both parties actually uh, for a number of different interests and is typically or is required by the uh, CRTC, that's the uh, regulator uh, for this kind of service. So, so that's the first step and, and we wanted to uh, get uh, direction from council to enter enter into those agreements um, and also a small fee for our solicitor to review uh, said draft agreement that Kojiko has already provided. And, and there on the screen is the map of the service area that's been uh, highlighted by Kojiko. And uh, this is through the program called the SWIFT. So, you know, we've been hearing about the SWIFT program for quite a long time. Uh, now we're seeing the fruits of, of that program uh, here in Severn. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask you to take that off so I can see all the members. There we are, thank you. Uh, Member Burkett. Thank you, through the chair to Derek. So Derek, that map, it um, it shows, uh, I think, going up Canal Road, correct? That's correct. So it, uh, seemed to, it seems to have missed Boyd Road, and I know it's not up to us, and I've been trying to get a hold of the contact name for the provider to understand better why they've avoided Boyd Road. And I know that we don't have a contact. I did find a number. I'm still trying to reach the, the person. Um, but that, like, there's nothing that we can do from this end to understand better why they didn't go up Boyd Road. Is that correct? Uh, th through the chair. So, I mean, each uh, service provider of telecom services does choose their business model and where they will service. Um, it, it's not something the municipality necessarily engages with. However, um, if there are a lack of, of services and maybe perhaps the supplier does not know that, um, you know, that'd be a worthwhile discussion. So, you know, I believe that following this conversation, you know, staff can bring that back to the uh, uh, the applicant here and just make aware that there are additional uh, potential services in that area. Supple supplementary through the chair, if I may, to Derek. Derek, could we do that just to see what the response is? And then I'll follow up with the uh, the contact that I, I have and hopefully, uh, we can provide service for Boyd or at least better understand why they're not going down Boyd Road? Certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Member Taylor. To the chair to Derek, do you know, can you answer this question? Is it a tower or is it uh, fiber optics? Thank you. Yeah, through the chair, this is uh, this is in-ground services. So they're, uh, I believe they are fiber optic services. And um, and that's a first for that area for sure. You know, that uh, that area has been underserved for quite a long time. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, I have a question, Derek. Now, according to that map, can you determine how far out so far road they're going? Uh, through the chair, I'll have to just bring up that map one more time. But perhaps after this meeting, we can just circulate the map, uh, you know, for council to be aware of where the service area is. Yes. Okay. That's fine. Thank you very much. I, it, I looked at it and it didn't seem to go all the way to where the lodges and that were, but uh, I would just be interested to see how far it goes. All right, any further questions from the committee? Uh, yes, Member Dunlop. Through the chair, so that's another good question for Derek to ask because the, the uh, lodges had concern before about customers weren't coming because they needed that internet. Right. Uh, connection. So if Derek can bring that one up too, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, Madam Clerk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the motion reads that Public Works Report number W21-043 dated October 27th, 2021 regarding Kojiko Municipal Access Agreement be received and further that the staff be directed to undertake it, review and negotiate and prepare a Municipal Access Agreement for Council's consideration. Thank you very much. Do we have a mover on that? Uh, yes, uh, Member Burkett, you have want, would want to speak on that again? Sorry, through the chair to Allison. We don't need to put in that report that Derek is is going to ask uh, what I spoke to earlier. No, I will note that as direction afterwards. And then also South Sparrow Lake Road as well. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very kindly. Uh, do we have a mover on that? Uh, yes, Member Cox, as Circuitor, Member Dunlop, all in favor? And that has passed, Madam Clerk.
We move on now to F2.3, uh, speed limits, uh, Carol on the line. And I imagine that's uh, Mr. Burke again. <laughs> Sorry, that'll be me. Um, so a couple weeks ago, one of the things that uh, was kind of used to justify the creation of my position was this nifty little black box. Um, it's a radar device that we put up on posts on street and it tracks the uh, the speed of travel on that section of road going both ways. Carlin Road uh, was identified as a concern at one point um, by some residents that, uh, you know, a lot of speeding going on between, I think it was uh, the Stewart Pit and Stockdale Road and then continuing on to Cambrian. So I ended up putting the box up um, where I saw there was a lot of skid marks on the road, right, which kind of shows that there's something happening there at some point. Um, the report, so it was there for seven days and the uh, the average speed of travel that was found in that seven day period was, sorry, the, the 85th percentile was 91 kilometers. Carlin is an 80 kilometer road. Um, there are some like, speeds like, that were reached that like, I think it was like above 110. Um, <coughs> some vehicles traveling around 110 on that road, um, but nothing, like not a significant amount over the seven days. Um, the Transportation Association of Canada has a formula in place um, that we can use to identify if that road has a correct speed assigned to it or any road. Um, so I, I used their formula and it identified that that section of road should be at a 70 kilometer an hour uh, speed limit uh, it's currently at an 80 the department would suggest that we leave it at 80 because um, if we were to drop it down to 70 then we would have to install signposts along the way um, the average speed travel is 91 kilometers already um, so bringing it down it's you know it, it'll it's not really going to provide a whole lot of revenue for the township necessarily but it'll cost in having to put the signs up um, we did forward this to the OPP so they can identify the uh, the times for enforcement for the vehicles that you know do travel over the uh, the speed limit and uh, tolerance. Um, and uh, I guess that's on up to them to see what they would schedule for enforcement. But uh, yeah, that's uh, it. Really, um, ninety-one kilometers average speed posted for eighty. Recommend that it keeps at eighty. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, comments from the committee? Uh, Member Taylor. Yeah, <clears throat> I still believe uh, lowering speed, uh, there shouldn't be, if it's to improve safety and the cars will come down, whether you make it 60 or, uh, so I, I don't see, the reason why it's here is some people are complaining that cars are speeding there and uh, I can't see any reason why we wouldn't drop the speed. Thank you very much, uh, Member Taylor. Uh, Member Dunlop. Uh, thank you. Through the chair to Alex. When you say it's 110, are, are the speed limits at night or are they during the day? So that's uh, that's in the raw file that uh, we sent to OPP. Um, right. We do have the software that identifies what time uh, yeah. those vehicles are traveling. So in, in that seven day period, there were 25 vehicles that were traveling over 110. Um, I don't have the, the sheet in front of me that identifies what time that was. It would be easy to pull up, you know, it, it's I gotta go through the software and everything, but it will tell me that. Um, I'm thinking it's probably gonna be at night, but that information right now is with the OPP. Okay, so further to that, um, our radar sign, has that been put out on that strip along there at all? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Burke. Through the chair. So every, every one of these speed reviews uh, does come with sort of the next steps. And so the Public Works Department next step in this particular area, it's flagged as having a slightly, um, you know, overage on speed. However, that's why we're recommending that the posted speed limit remain the same at 80. Uh, we would be putting this on our routine traffic calming list, which does include 
deploying the uh, traffic radar sign out and that would encourage some more compliance as well as what we've already done and forward that to the OPP uh, you know for active patrols in the area and in those targeted times it's uh, it's a difficult thing to um, take a few outliers uh, you know 25 or so vehicles traveling at a, a complete excess speed in the middle of the night and apply that as as typical traffic on that roadway and that's why the uh, enforcement is so critical thank you and just supplementary I always like when, if we got complaints from residents that we were able to put that radar sign out, at least it shows our residents that we're acting on this. So thanks for your update. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Uh, yes, Member Cox. Through the chair to Derek or Alex, I kind of agree with uh, Member Taylor on this one. If we've got speed limits that high, I don't care if it's in the middle of the night or not, and, and the average is 90, and this person isn't the only person who's complained. I've had two complaints, and I don't know that they obviously didn't send them in. Then I think if, if it says that we should be reducing the speed on there, we should. And I'm, I'm sorry that it's going to cost something, but it seems that other places, when they get complaints about speed, they change it if, if it's an, a need. I can see if we ask for it to be changed and the report analysis came back and said, everything's fine, it's, don't worry about it. But I think we have an issue. And we also know that that's a road that those huge tractors are on from Toppelmeyers and other ones that are going down because that's part of a, a complaint I had about parking along the side of the road on there because of those couldn't get through. And those travel at night too. So I, I just kind of think that it should be changed. Um, yes, Mr. Burke. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, completely understand you know that position i think the heart you know what we are looking to rationalize is this is a low volume rural roadway with yes yeah, slight exceedance in operating speed um, while the tac geometry guidelines may indicate 70 kilometers an hour on that particular roadway that's only a 10 10 kilometer an hour decrease with a, a very limited amount of impact given the volume on the roadway um, certainly, council uh, could, you know, not accept the recommendation by uh, by staff and direct that the post speed limit be lowered. The impact does have a financial cost to it. Thank you, uh, Member Burkett. Thank you. Through the chair, so I doubt that they're speeding at night because I don't think anyone sitting in their home or they're not sitting out on the side of the road looking to see how fast a car is going. I was out there twice last week, and I believe it's during the day and it's locals that are the ones that are speeding. I would, with council's indulgence, I would rather have the OPP, if they can corner the time, and I'm sure it's the same time every day that they're doing it, and maybe just run a couple of patrols and let's just see what happens. Like I'm happy to drop the speed limit, but let's let's give the OPP a chance because it is, is, it is the locals that are speeding. When I was standing on the side of the road, I witnessed a black Chevy and it, it was doing at least 110. Thank you very much, uh, Member Burkett. Uh, my comment would be that uh, I agree with uh, Member Taylor and uh, Cox on this and perhaps uh, Dunlop, but I, uh, I, I do believe that that should be lowered. Um, and uh, uh, Member Burkett has thrown in another a wrinkle there with regard to maybe an intermediate step first and then uh, move to um, uh, to probably lowering the speeds if uh, that uh, indicates that we should. So um, Madam Clerk, uh, we have a, a difference of opinion here. Um, how should we construct this uh, motion? Uh, it's entirely up to council if they want to propose that the speed limit be per, be reduced. Um, the recommendation is that it be maintained at 80 kilometers an hour. So if council would like to propose something different, then that's up to a member to put onto the table. And we can always include the request to OPP that increased enforcement be conducted. All right. Um, in that regard, I will put, bring that. No, I can't bring the motion forward. One of you can bring the motion forward if you wish to uh, find out whether we have consensus on the speed reduction there. Uh, do we have a member that would like to do that? Uh, member Taylor. Uh, yeah, I would move it. I would move it forward. Thank you. Member if Taylor. I can, member Taylor, what would you like it reduced to 70? Yes. Okay. 
That is the motion that's on the floor. Do we have a seconder, please? Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll read out the motion if that would help. Yes, well, certainly. One second to add the clause with respect to the OPP. Um, so we have one more comment before you do that from Member Burkett. Thank you, through the chair. Can we, and I'm happy to support this, but I also would like to know if uh, they are speeding at night, it's more prevalent, or is it during the daytime hours? Uh, Mem Member Dunlop. And I'd also like to make sure that we deploy, that we ask the police to put a call out to go out there. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes, uh, Alex. Sorry, through the chair to uh, Mayor Mike there, uh, Worship. I I just pulled up the uh, the data for uh, the time of uh, the excess okay. speeds, and it, it does vary throughout um, late morning or late afternoon into the evening. So it's within either late morning or mid evening where most of the speeding is happening. So um, that would tell me that uh, the speed reduction may be more necessary than we thought. But anyways, uh, we do we have a motion on the floor, uh, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Uh, so the motion will read that Public Works Report number W21-044 dated October 27th, 2021. With respect to a speed limit review, Carly Online be received. And further that the posted speed limit on Carly Online be from Stewart Pit to Stockdale Road be reduced to 70 kilometers an hour. And further that increased OPP enforcement be requested in the area. Thank you very kindly. Uh, do we have a seconder to that motion? We, we uh, uh, Mr. Member Taylor moved it. Uh, Member Cox seconded. Uh, all in favor? Uh, Madam Clerk, that has passed. Thank you. All right, we're on F2.4, and that's Public Works Report uh, W21045, Coldwater Road Pedestrian. Uh, crossover and Mr. Burke. Thank you very much uh, through the chair. So this report just highlights um, what we're planning to propose for the 2022 budget and the cold water pedestrian crossover, which has had a varying of success. Um, we installed that crossover approximately two years ago. Um, we've seen some, some compliance and also some non-compliance. Uh, generally speaking, it was well received initially, but uh, definitely our service request data shows that we're getting a number of concerns. Um, also, we are engaging with uh, Mr. Yateman, actually, uh, from the OPP in, uh, in reviewing all the township's road safety concerns, and this is one that we've discussed. So that's what we're looking to do, is to uh, improve the pedestrian crossover in 2022, um, and I'm open to take any questions. Okay, member, uh, member Dunlop. Through the chair to Derek, uh, thanks for this report. I've been in town and honestly, it's like a speedway. It, and I, it's just people don't even look for that crosswalk, even if the lights are flashing. The speed coming down that main street from either end, whether it's coming from the west or the south, is incredible. I don't know what in the world we can do other than to deploy the police out there for more often if they could and the other big problem at that light is people continually park in the no parking in front of the library which is where the crosswalk is and they actually park on top of the crosswalk i i just i don't get it i don't know what more we can do in that area than to mark the roadway there instead of just saying no parking which is wearing off is can we do more painting on the road I, it's, it's deployable. It's it's hard to take, and we certainly don't want somebody hurt there. Thank you, Member Cox. Yeah, through the chair to Derek. Derek, I had sent you that information from Collingwood on the crossover there, which indicated that they've had trouble with that design of their crossover, and taken from the Ontario Traffic Manual, and they've received complaints, and they're coming up with another idea. I won't bring it up right now and discuss it, but I, I would like maybe if we sent out that information with the budget package to the rest of council, because it does explain the difference between a crossover and a crosswalk, and the ideas that somebody else has come up with because they're running into the same problem that we are. 
And I agree with Member Dunlop, <clears throat> the issue of the no parking. Those old uh, white parking lines are still visible. So I think if you're planning on painting, it should either be cross hatched or something very big to say it's not. People don't understand or can't see that it's not no parking. And I know that you said that I think we got held up with our painting because of COVID or something had happened. And I understand that. So if we could have that information sent out of Collingwood's with the budget and maybe look into getting that painting done, then maybe we can come up with something for this crosswalk and maybe even it would help out at Marchmount. Thank you. Certainly. Was it uh, Member Burkett? Thank you through the chair. So Member uh, Cox, I just wanted to make sure that Derek had on his radar uh, Marchmount and the one at Severn Shores as well if we come up with a, a solution for Wache or uh, cold water. Uh, Member Dunlop. Just in that cluster, don't forget about Washego. It's, I know it's there and it's supposed to be visible if you're going the proper speed, but again, I was up there the other day too and people don't even seem to recognize it's there. So if you will include that also, I'd appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Burke. Yeah, through, through the chair. I mean, the report is uh, very narrowly focused on Coldwater Road pedestrian crossover. The Wachago crossover on Muskoka Street will effectively be eliminated by the installation of traffic signals at County Road 169 uh, in the 2022 budget that we proposed. Um, you're actually not permitted to have said crossing near um, a, a signalized intersection. And the other one there at Cumberland, we're definitely not seeing um, any service requests or complaints regarding that particular crossing, much different roadway. Um, so those are not currently being considered. Uh, I would take a motion from council to, to direct staff to consider those as well for additional improvements. All right, uh, Member Cox. Yeah, quickly through the chair to Derek. And Derek, could you put the difference between a crossover and a crosswalk in? Because there is a big difference between them. Thank you. All right, uh, any further comments? Uh, Seeing none, uh, Madam Clerk, did you capture that? Uh, right now, I have the motion as tabled in the report, which is that Public Works Report Number W21-045, dated October 27th, 2021, with respect to the Coldwater Road pedestrian crossover, be received as information. That is the motion. I have additional direction that I will note in the minutes um, that the calling what information be passed along that information be also passed along with respect to the difference between a crosswalk and a crossover. Uh, Member Dunlop. Thank you. Through the chair to Allison then. Do we talk about this going to budget or is it what's going on with it? Like we're just today we're taking this information. We want it to be dealt with. So do we have some direction on that motion, please? I believe I'll need some clarification from the Director of Public Works as to what he would like to see or what his intent is with respect to the budget. Yeah. Thank you, through the Chair. So this report is actually for information. It would have been on the consent portion of this agenda. Um, the staff are, are proposing a 2022 capital budget that has improvements to the pedestrian crossover at Cumberland Road. The purpose of the report is to give committee uh, an opportunity A, to discuss, or B, to understand some of the concerns that we've had and to address some, some more recent concerns that were conveyed to most of council, if not all. Um, so that's the purpose of the report. The, the draft capital plan is where we deliberate projects that are either in or out um, and, uh, and set the capital budget for the, for the fiscal year 2022. Um, typically, you wouldn't necessarily include something now, but I refer to uh, perhaps the treasurer <laughs> if, uh, if a motion is to carry to uh, already put items into the 2022 budget. So, uh, Member Dunlop, then we're referring this to budget. Well, uh, I think, sorry, supplementary, I think um, Derek Burke just asked Andrew Plunkett if we needed to do that at this point. So if Andrew's... Is, is that what you were asking? Yeah, if I can, through the chair, I, I believe Derek's already mentioned that it's already in his budget. So it is Perfect. already going to budget deliberations. Great, thanks. I just wanted, didn't want to leave it as information only. I wanted direction, but that's yeah. great. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, do we have a mover for that motion? Uh, Member Dunlop, a seconder. Uh, Member Stevens, all in favor? Madam Clerk, that has passed.
Perfect. Uh, Mr. Chair, perhaps I suggest a five minute bio break before we start admins. That would be lovely. All right. Uh, we will take a five minute break and return uh, promptly in five minutes. Thank you.
Ready All when right. you are. Thank you. Uh, members of the committee, we are on F5.1, uh, Administration Report A21041. And I'm going to ask uh, Lynn to speak to that. Good morning, Lynn. Good morning. Thank you through the chair. Um, so I'll share my screen. We're excited to show uh, updated signage based on your feedback. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes, that's fine. Okay, excellent. Uh, so this first concept, uh, as you'll remember, we had presented two options for our community signage uh, for our community of communities at the la last committee meeting. Uh, this is an updated version, and this is what we're recommending for community signage. Uh, it includes a simplified version of the signs, and we've removed that black um, square that was behind it. So it's um, it's simple, it's on brand, and um, and staff are recommending this for the community signage. Uh, and what we're also recommending is that we repurpose uh, option A, so the original option A. Uh, we've simplified it as well. We re removed the tiling at the bottom, and we're recommending that this be repurposed for facility signage. So those are the two big changes um, from our last report. Uh, and we're looking uh, from the committee today to, um, to support the look and feel of the signage in this report. Thank you, um, Lynn, for that. Uh, can you uh, remove that off the screen so I can see the, uh, there we are. All right, uh, Member Dunlop, a question? Uh, please unmute yourself, Member Dunlop. I tried to hold my space bar down, but it doesn't work. This updated itself last night. Uh, so through the chair to Lynn, I don't see the one that I remember us choosing, and that was the one that had the um, bridge, let's say, of the five communities across the bottom, and then up the side, yes, you were to take that, it was just to say Severin up there, Welcome to Wishago, and then that bridge was across the bottom. I this one it doesn't even appear here now. Uh, Lynn, if I may, uh, what I could do is I can show you side by side the the options if that would be helpful to show what we've changed. Um, Please do. Want to wait one moment, and I can see if I can pull them up together on the same screen here. In, in the meantime, member uh, Dunlop, did you have another question? Oh, um, no, I just, it was my understanding at that last meeting that we chose the Severin, or that we chose the bridge with the five wards, that's what I'm calling them, across the bottom where there's just like different colors, that we chose the bridging across the bottom and then Severin stayed where it was. And yeah, you took that black line off it but then you just said, welcome to Shago, Severn Falls, whatever. But now it's this one. Okay, can everyone see my screen if I may? Not yet. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Okay, this should be good then. Yep. So these are, uh, I don't, I can't put them side by side. I can go back and forth uh, in sharing my screen. So these were the original options. So this was option A where we had this little uh, curve at the top uh, with the single reverse tiling at the bottom with this little box saying, welcome to Wishago. Uh, the second option had the full color tiling at the bottom with the black box behind it. So, um, so what we've done is we've gone ahead and simplified the um, the signage and remove the tiling at the bottom because we understood that council didn't particularly like that and wanted to simplify the signage and we've also simplified um, this here so that it's just a white background and added in um, a line at the bottom so what we're recommending for the 
The other signage, which I can go back to, is that we use option A for facility signage, a new and improved version of option A, uh, and the preferred option B from council, but simplified as, as council directed uh, for a community of communities. So if it's helpful, I can share the new one again, uh, if council would like to see that. Okay. Boring. Thank you. Uh, Member Cox had her uh, hand up. Yes, please. Uh, unmute. <laughs> Through the chair uh, to Lynn. Now that you put them side by side, and I did go back and look at them because I was thinking, gee, what's the difference? But now I do see the difference. I like this one that you have on the screen because it's clean, it's clear, and the uh, people who have designed these things know that, and they've come up with a very nice, clean design. So when you come in, it's not busy. It just welcome to Coldwater and our nice little brandings on the side. So I'm, uh, I'm in agreement with them. Thank you. All right, uh, Member Dunlop. I'm not in agreement, and, and I think this is too plain, and those uh, blocks across the bottom don't mean anything to me. I, I Last time when we talked about it, we had left it that it was going to be the tiles across the bottom, take the black line across Severn and the other one because you were actually duplicating Severn and the and the bridge and then you're bridging across the bottom so no uh you can put it out for a motion but I won't be supporting this one uh, uh yes Lynn uh, if I may offer a suggestion, if if council does prefer the tiling, the full color tiling at the bottom, um, Cinnamon Toast did provide that as an option. Uh, we thought council would find that it was still too complex, and so if if council wishes, uh, we do um, we can easily take the um, this. I don't know if you're still seeing my screen, but the the proposed signage here remove the squares at the bottom and replace that with the full color tiling if that's preferred that would still be within brand uh, that would be another option uh, we could still use uh, the 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 other option for facility signage so if council prefers to add in the tiling we, we can certainly do so member cox and then member taylor i'll let i'll let member taylor go first because i've already spoken all right member taylor thank you to the chair <clears throat> Looking at that one with the uh, the, the simple thing, see the logo at all. It won't mean it's just it's just a, a blur there. So, uh, uh, I kind of agree with uh, Member Dunlop that um, let's highlight the five wards and the bridge that like the whole concept behind the idea that we're we're all one township with uh, made up of five wards with different uh, characteristics. A member Cox. Yeah, through the chair. I'm not. I thought that everybody thought that that colored one at the bottom was too busy. I quite liked it before. That I that was the opinion I was left with. That people thought putting the whole colored thing at the bottom was too busy. It was I, I? I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. But I mean, if I I'm pretty game for things. But that's what I took out of the last meeting. I thought people liked the white one better. Let's let uh, Lori come in there, please, uh, CAO. Lori? Thank you. Yeah, I think that's what we were left with the last time, too. And it, it's a challenge because with with signage and branding, no one's ever going to like exactly the same things. But definitely, we were looking to simplify it. That's what we thought our instructions were. Uh, yes, Lynn. Uh, if I may, so this is an option, and I believe this is what Council is looking for based on the discussion. Um, so if you can see my screen, this is uh, exactly what we've presented to you. It's not what's in the report, but it has the updating, updated tiling at the bottom. So if council prefers, this was an option that um, Cinnamon Toast did bring forward. We didn't think that council would like it, so we asked them to simplify it further for us. So um, staff are, you know, are supportive of this design. And so if council prefers this option, we're, we're happy to go in that direction. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, Member Dunlop. So, so when we looked at this last time, and maybe I wasn't thorough on what I thought, 
that was too busy because we didn't it's important that we show the branding we've spent all this money on branding so it's important that we show the branding the thing was we didn't need the branding in two places you don't need the branding up in the corner and then across the bottom so it was just say sever and i don't i can't read what's between the branding and sever in there lynn can you uh, yeah i can make it larger if that's helpful township of severin so just take that first branding away from there and township of severin welcome to and then the branding across the bottom it simplifies it it's not cluttered it still shows our branding of what we spent the money on and the time to get to here. But again, that's my opinion, put it to emotion. Well, yes, Lynn. If I may just respond to that, I think, I think we absolutely need the logo, the full logo in the sign. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't recommend removing the logo. Um, if you wanna simplify it further, then I would go to the, to the um, version that's in the report. That's my, my personal opinion. Thank you, Member Taylor. And just through to you at the chair, to Lynn. So why on the bottom do we have 10 vignettes when, so, so they're, they're duplicated. Why, why do we do that? Like you see, there's two mills there, two canoes, two downtown areas. Why, why? now that's what's making it really cluttered up too, I think. Uh, Lynn? Yeah, so uh, part of our brand is this pattern, and so it could be used repetitively. Uh, if we simplify it to five, the dimensions wouldn't work, so the sign would need to be uh, much taller, and uh, those tiles would take up much more space. So the only way to simplify it would be to do the one color version of it, which was in the original proposal uh, of the first one, which we can do. So let me see if I have that version. Actually, I don't have that one pulled up, but we could do the single um, colored tiling that could simplify it, or we could remove it altogether. Those are essentially the two, two solutions to simplify the tiling, is either remove it or create a single color tiling. Number Dunlop. So I'll get this right yet. Through the chair to Lynn. So in our report that came on our agenda, the very first one that you have on there says welcome. It's got the brand and then it's got Township of Severin. Can you, can you pull that one up? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So, um, and I can explain the difference between the two. So let me stop sharing this screen and reshare the, the, the original version. Just bear with me one moment, please. Uh, in the meantime, Member Burkett. Thank you. So I think the first time, the one that was up on the screen that had the 10, our logo along the bottom, everyone thought it was too busy. We can't take the smaller logo to Lynn's point. We can't take that out because we're trying to, to, uh, to show our logo and, and the township of Severn. Whether whichever community we're welcoming, we need to have that logo there with the township of Severn so people understand that they are in the township of Severn, regardless of which hamlet they're in. Lynn? Yeah, so if I may, uh, I just pulled up the welcome signage. So this gateway signage is what would uh, be along the highways when you're entering Severn. So this showcases Severn, uh, whereas the other option where it says welcome to the community name is intended to be within the communities. So that's the difference between this one and this one. It's not one or the other. It would be um, the signage would complement each other. So you would see this on the highway, and then you would go into a community like Coldwater and see a welcome to Coldwater sign. Okay, I understand that now. Thank you. Um, uh, any other comments from uh, the committee? All right. Uh, just uh, my, my own comment, uh, the, the uh, welcome along the highway sign looks fine to me. I, I like that one. Um, and uh, so I it just, this is my opinion. Uh, I don't think we need any further work on that. Um, and uh, I 
just want to make sure we emphasize the, the ward uh, system uh, in uh, the different uh, towns. So uh, any, any further comment uh, from the committee? Uh, yes, uh, Member Dunlop. Oh. Sorry again, an update's messed this up. So through the chair, just so that we know what we're voting on today, we're not voting on that welcome to Severn, we're voting on the welcome to West Shore Port Severn at Archery, right? Uh, Lynn. If I may, uh, through the chair, uh, what we're asking council to support is the full look and feel of signage. So that includes the welcome um, to Severn, the welcome to Coldwater, as an example, um, the type of wayfinding, the um, other examples that are in the package. Thank, thank you, Lynn. The so general look and feel. Let's let's take them one at a time, then, please, so yes. we don't get confused. Uh, the welcome to Severn, the highway sign. Uh, do we have agreement that the one that was thrown up here a couple of minutes ago uh, is uh, acceptable? Um, yes, uh, Member Taylor. Yeah, just a quick question. Where would they go? Like, do we have different points along the, like, are we looking at four locations or just curious before we vote on it? Now, yes, Lynn. Yeah, if I may. So the next report that you'll see has a signage implementation plan that uh, proposes the location. So we'll we'll review that um, in in the next report. But it is the the communities, so the eight communities and the two hamlets that are included in the scope of signs for the community types of signs. And, and Lynn, uh, just a, a comment there. Does that welcome to Severn also appear um, on the corner of our township office? and uh, coming in uh, from West Street to uh, to the office area. If I may, I don't have the exact locations of the sign, but we will review that in the next report. Thank you very much, uh, Member Dunlop. So I'm gonna find this hard to vote. I'm gonna ask for a recorded vote on the one that I don't like because I don't. it doesn't matter to me how anybody else votes. I just don't like that one sign. The welcome yep. to Severn is perfect. The uh, wayfinding signs we'll talk about, but I'm not happy with this one and I won't vote for it. So I wanna make sure that we divide these votes up. Okay, uh, just so we're clear, at the moment we're speaking about the welcome to Severn signs, not the Hamlet signs. So uh, I wanna break it down because it can get confusing if we go back and forth. So here is uh, the uh, thumbnail, if you like, on the welcome to Severn signs placed on highways or other major points uh, that will be uh, uh, shown. Um, do we have agreement on that? Uh, yes or no? Okay, let's uh, put that one aside, Lynn. We have agreement on the highway sign that you threw up there and uh, now we go to the uh, Hamlet. Mr. Mr. Chair, if I can ask a question here. So a minute ago, I had a council member ask that the question be divided. So are we doing formal motions on every type of signage here, or would you like one in general? Well, I think uh, because yeah. we have two different signs uh, and two different purposes of what we're trying to accomplish, we've nailed down now the welcome to Severin sign with regard to highway placements or other key points into the township. Uh, let's do that on a motion, just so that we can get agreement. We have agreement on that, on a thumbnail. Uh, and uh, now we're, we now move to what I call the village and hamlet uh, identification signs as to whether or not which one we wish to accept there. And uh, that's where I would like to direct the attention or the comments now is to the village and hamlet preferences, uh, comments. Uh, member Taylor and yes, Member Taylor. I wonder, well, Lynn, could, how hard is it to uh, come up with a, a community sign showing just the five, like they don't have to cover the whole, bottom of it, they could cover up whatever the equal size are with the five 
vignette, sir. Uh, yes, uh, the CAO, Laurie, please. Thank you. Um, I think Lynn showed two options, one with the bar on the bottom and one with the vignettes. And she had mentioned that if you change it, the sizing doesn't work. So I, I appreciate everybody wants it to be perfect, but we did hire an expert to put this together and we tried to take council's feedback. I, I don't know that we're ever gonna get to something that's absolutely perfect for everybody, but if we don't take the advice that we're given, then we're gonna end up with a product that doesn't work. Thank you, uh, Member uh, Taylor, and then Member Dunlop. Well, well, I just think like we're trying not to make it look too busy, and that's just a, 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 a repeating, like it's five and then five. I think that's it's really busy. Uh, member Dunlop and then Member Bur Burkett. I realize we've hired experts, but we are the ones that have to live with this, and we have to answer to our residents for it. Thank you, Member D uh, Burkett. Thank you, through the chair, and to, to Member Taylor's uh, comments, exactly, that's why we went back. It was too busy when it was originally presented to us, and as Lynn has demonstrated, we she came back with it colored along the bottom, Township of Severance smaller on the one side, and then the name of the hamlet that we're in. So in my mind, that's perfect. I think that's a, that's a great sign logo. Thank you, uh, Member Burkett, Member Cox. Yeah, um, if you look at the sign that we saw today with just the colors underneath the bottom and the Township of Severn, once that sign's bigger, that Township of Severn with our logo on it will pop. And the important thing is we wanna welcome them to our hamlets. So I am for that one that they brought in today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's, uh, Lynn, if you would, uh put up those two options again and I'm going to take a vote on those two options. I'd like to nail this one down. So that's the simplified one that I believe uh, our consultants are recommending now uh, mm -hmm. for the, for the uh, hamlets and villages. And then let's throw up now, Lynn, the other one, please, for that was initially considered I think too busy. That's the one. Yes, thank you. That so this will be option B. Okay. Remember, and the other one will be option A. So uh, if we go back to a full screen, I'm going to propose uh, a vote, please, uh, that will be incorporated in a motion. Uh, the simplified. Uh, option is option A. A and the other one is option B. We're going to vote for option A first please. All in favor? Well we don't need to go any further. That uh, has... I want, excuse me chair, I want to record a vote on that one. Well we haven't gotten to a motion yet. This was just okay. a thumbnail. Uh, we'll get to that when we when we hear the actual motion. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, now, uh, Madam Clerk, if you will break those down into two motions, please. The one where we have total consensus on is the highway one. Uh, yes, Lynn, go ahead. Uh, if I may, um, just uh, there are other sign types, uh, so I'm not sure if you want to, if, if council is comfortable with the other sign types, uh, the motion as is would work, uh, but that's just, just an, an option there. Well, let me ask the committee, do you want to see any more options? Uh, yes, Member Taylor. I think uh, Lynn is showing it. The, the wayfinding signs are the one that you're contemplating. I'm just looking at the one that says Simcoe County Trail Route you've got on there. Um, so once again, the, the, the township is being as minimized there. And, and is that what's going to show up? They go to the boat ramp and stuff like that. That So the, 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 uh, the vignette in the left-hand side is trying to identify that's one of the five characteristics of the township? Is that what you're showing up there? Lynn. Yeah, if I may, I can share my screen and, and explain the different types 
uh, and help try to help clarify that. Yeah, that one right there. Uh, so the I know you're speaking about this one, but I'm just going to move up here. So this facility signage is is what we're proposing for parks, for docks, uh, for other facilities. Um, and then the wayfinding is directional signage, so instructions on how to get somewhere. So often these are in partnership with other mm -hmm. other partners, other stakeholders like the County of Simcoe. Uh, and what uh, Cinnamon Toast was recommending is that we use, uh, when appropriate, tiles from our brand. So for example, if we're saying, um, you know, uh, here's how to get to our historical buildings in cold water, well, we would select uh, our historical uh, building tile. If we're saying, um, you know, here's our, the way to the boat uh, launch, then we would use our uh, second tile as an example. So this was just a suggestion, a general look and feel of what that wayfinding might look like. Whereas uh, what we're proposing is that our facilities such as parks, uh, where we need to include the address, uh, is is this sign here? So that's that's what a staff is proposing. So as a whole, we're just looking for committee to um, support the look and feel of these signs because there are many signs, as you'll notice in the next report, that aren't necessarily captured. So we just wanted to have council uh, support the general look and feel of of the signage today. River Taylor, thank you. Yeah, can, can can you through the chair to Lynn? Can you show a sign that? that is strictly it's run by the township, like say a community center or something like that. Certainly, so if I may through the chair, um, so that's this sign here. So that's what we're recommending for facility signage. So if it's a dock or a park or a community center, uh, you would have the community center name uh, in this section here and the address below it. Yeah, just a, I'm looking at the one you've got for bolt launch there, and it's got the whole township logo on it. You have that, um, Lynn? Uh, I'm I'm maybe not understanding. Sorry, if you can just clarify your question. Yeah, I, I'm I'm looking at your report here, and you've got I think maybe scrolled. Is this off the report, or is this? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. this one here. Yeah, I see. That one there. Yeah. So it so it shows boat launch, but there like I mixed up on what the what you're getting at. That's showing the whole township Severn. So basically on your logic, it should have had a boat on there. So if I may, through the chair, uh, so that's another example of wayfinding signage where it's uh, just a township of Severn sign rather than a partnership sign. Uh, so there's those, again, are just examples of look and feel. They don't necessarily need to be those exact. Um, and, and that, as you'll notice in the next report, isn't until year, say, four or five of the report uh, or of the plan. So it's something that if council wishes, we can revisit in the future. We were really just looking for um, feedback on um on the general look and feel of these signs so uh when we have partnership it would be it would be something like this when there are multiple uh assets that we're looking to go to it would be like the one on the left hand side if there's a single asset so it would be um a combination of these types of wayfinding signage all right um if we can go back to uh, full, thank you. Um, again, let's not get uh, down in the weeds here where we're getting confused between sides. We, uh, I would like, first of all, to, to nail down the highway welcome signs. Secondly is the uh, village and hamlets sign and then these uh, special event or special area signs. Uh, I don't see anything wrong with this, this last one with regard to uh, municipal parking lot uh, uh, and, and the rest of it. I, I think that's very clear as to what, where people are to go or what they're going to see. But um, Madam Clerk, um, can we put up uh, a, a motion, first of all, on the highway welcome signs, and then subsequently after that, uh, put up a motion with regard to the simplified 
hamlet and village for a vote and then we will um, entertain uh, comments on the specific event signs uh, if you wish or we can let uh, Lynn or, or, or whoever develop further on that. So can we have the first two? I'd like to start to nail down certain areas here. So can we do the first two motions first, Madam Clerk? Certainly, just give me a moment here, Mr. Chair. Okay. And, and then, then Lynn knows what has been decided and what may still need some tweaking. One moment here. Remember, okay, remember, so. Uh, remember, remember down off, go ahead. Sorry, through the chair, it was just a question while Allison was getting ready there. As we approve all this today, are we approving this whole thing to go ahead? Or are we just approving that this is what it is and in the future we'll move on to the next and the future we'll move on to the next? Yes. Well, then, then. If I may, so today we're just um, we're just providing support for the look and feel of the signage. There's no budget impact to this report. Uh, the next report is where we'll we'll speak to the the implementation plan. Thank you. Thank you, Carly. Go ahead, uh, Allison, please. Okay, so remember this is all broken apart. So the first motion is is that the proposed welcome to Severn entrance signage be approved. Uh, Yes, do we have a, um, a mover for that? Uh, Member McIntyre, a seconder. Member Dunlop, all, all in favor? Uh, Madam Clerk, that has passed. Okay. And then motion number two. The next motion is that the community, I'm calling it that the community signage as included in report A21041 being option A, be approved. And that's the simplified version that was included in the report. That, that's correct. Uh, Member Dunlop. Through the chair and Dallas, and remember I asked for a recorded vote on this. Thank you. Yes. All right. Uh, we will do that by recorded vote. Option A is the simplified. Option B is the busier one along the bottom. And uh, uh, over to you, Allison. Yes, I just need a mover and seconder. Uh, we have uh, Member Cox moving it, Member Burkett seconding it, and we'll have a recorded vote, please. Okay, uh, recorded vote requested by Member Dunlop. So Member Dunlop, for or against? That is against. Uh, Member McIntyre, for or against? Yes. Okay, Member Stevens, for or against? Say yes. Oh, perfect, thank you, that's four. Uh, member Taylor, for or against? No. Okay, Member Burkett, for or against? Yes. Okay, and Member Bettsworth, for or against? Four. I believe I have everyone, that is carried five to two. Thank you. Um, uh, mem um, no, no. Sorry, you missed Councillor Cox. No. Oh, apologies, Councillor Cox. Councillor <laughs> Cox. I just for... thought we might we might have somebody might get upset with us. We weren't transparent. <laughs> apologies, um, Member Cox, for or against? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, it's difficult when I'm okay, trying to all right, don't worry. Worry. <laughs> screens at home. Okay, right. so now now that is carried five to two. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Apologies. Okay, so uh, then the final one, Mr. Chair, would be that the facility and wayfinding signage be approved. That's correct. Uh, as, as Lynn put them up uh, there with regard to facilities and specific events, um, are you for or against those uh, signs that were issued as an option? Um, any comments from uh, the committee? Seeing none, um, do we have, a, is anybody requesting a, a recorded vote on this? No. Then for the uh, specific, do we have a mover? Uh, we have uh, Member Cox, a seconder, Member Burkett, all in favor? That has passed, uh, Madam Clerk. 
Thank you. And then just one final motion just to actually receive the report. <laughs> so I'm um, just going back. So now the motion will read that administration report number 821-041 dated October 27th, 2021 with respect to updated signage samples be received and that staff be directed to move forward with the proposed signage as directed. Thank you, uh, Member Dunlop. So just through to uh, Lynn, I guess, through the chair, we had street signs on there. Are we looking at those today also, or is that just something that's... Lynn. Uh, through the chair, staff uh, staff are not recommending that we that we uh, include that. It's not part of the implementation plan. If council wishes to include it, we can certainly add it, uh, but it's not something that staff is uh, recommending that we proceed with. Thanks. I just wanted to verify that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, where are we, Lynn? Lynn? We we're just we're just at that motion to generally accept the report and proceed oh. as directed. Do I have a mover? Yes, Member Cox, uh, seconder, Member McIntyre, all in favor. And that is passed. Uh, okay. Clerk. And I believe we are now done with that report. Hallelujah. Um, okay, uh, we're now on F5.2. And uh, uh, is that the one we're on? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, Eric Burke. Thank you, through the chair. And this is uh, co-authored with Lynn and myself, but I will start the, uh, the conversation. So what we did is now that we've selected a uh, look and feel uh, from the previous report, um, we gotta implement the signage installation. So we have a, a four year approach to this installation. It costs approximately $302,000, uh, which does seem like a lot, but uh, over, over the four year span, it should be reasonable. Uh, the first year, next year, is what we're considering for proposing in budget, right? So each individual year is individually approved, um, but this is the concept of how we'll reach the, the goal line, if you will, of having our entire township branded um, and, uh, and branded in a way that uh, provides wayfinding and some holisticness throughout the township and uh, encouraging the township of Severn, um, you know, in each, each individual. We're a community of communities. And, uh, and so we need to highlight both the fact that we're, we're, we're one and we're different. Um, so that's, that's the overall goal. You'll see that year one is primarily community, state or community uh, signs. And so that's uh, actually 18 listed on the individual locations and uh, just one plus here at the admin office. The admin office does have another project that will see the LED community sign um, also get installed, but it's not exactly part of this brand implementation plan. Um, and as we go through, we're, we're establishing the typical materials. Uh, staff are quite excited that the, um, the draft designs and, and the material selection that we'll use are going to be low maintenance. Um, they're going to, uh, uh, in most instances around the community signs, have sm small landscape features around them. And, uh, and that's what we're looking forward to in 2022. So I open up for any questions. Thank you. Um, member Collins. Yes, so I, I like the first year plan you have, and I understand that we're gonna use the money from the economic development reserve. And then the rest of it will all be if we can get any more in money from any um, other sources. And that uh, then it'll go to the budget and we'll talk about the year one plan, right? Correct. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Member Dunlop. So through the chair to Derek, we do have some um, Hamlet signs that are really, really, really in bad shape. And I think you know the ones. Is there a way of, of moving them, giving us an option of moving one or two of those forward? Uh, through, through the chair, I, staff wouldn't recommend that. Uh, the application of all of the signs at once is going to generate a cost savings. Um, and there is a bit of initial design work to be undertaken in 2022. Um, at this late season, you know, we're, we're just at the tail end of 2021. Staff are recommending that a 2022 project be, be executed. Okay, okay. so for just a supplementary. Yes. Um, when you look at the one going into Port Severn, it's, it's really a disgrace. Our Severn sign is falling off it. It looks like it's rotting. Um, how much 
do you know how much each one of these signs would be? And I know you just can't implement one, but we should do something with that sign going into Port Severn. Like it's a disgrace. And we do have a signed budget. Are we drawing any money from the signed budget towards this? Through the chair, uh, the signed budget is is somewhat separate. That's the, uh, I think it's a $5,000 kind of annual um, allowance, if you will, under the council or, uh, category. That's not the proposal here. This is a capital request uh, that's coming for 2022 to implement the community signage. And we will prioritize, uh, you know, certain ones that are in state of disrepair for, for sort of the first replacement, if you will, um, in 2022 as a full package with all of them. Um, the, uh, the one going into Marchmont is not in good shape either, but we'll leave that to the public works to uh, prioritize their work. Member Taylor. Yeah, through the chair <clears throat> to Derek, <clears throat> I'd hate to replace a sign that's in perfect shape like just because it, it, it may still have more years on it. Like I, I hate taking down a perfectly good sign with lots of life in it and then just simply replace it because we want to enhance the, uh, the, uh, our, our uh, economic development. Like I think we've, we've got to balance our monies frugally here and if the signs need replacing, then you replace them, use your judgment there. But if they don't do it, yeah, come up with a, a justification why you're going to replace them. Just to replace them for the sake of replacing uh, doesn't cut it with me. Yeah. Uh, uh, Derek, did you want to respond? Yeah. Through, through the chair, I mean, staff have recommended an implementation plan that is selective on category um, and, and a wholesome replacement. And so what that looked like for us doing the, the bit of background review that we did, the community signs, as you've noticed, are prioritized ahead of all other signs. And some of the rationale behind that is most were installed around the same time and most are in a state of disrepair. So we have uh, addressed physical mortality in this plan along with implementing. However, we have a four year goal. Um, and so some signs that are, are relatively good condition may not have exceeded their end of life, um, you know, would be replaced under this implementation plan. Now, member Cox. Yeah, through the chair, thank you. That's what I was going to say is that a lot of those signs are in bad shape. So thank you, Derek. Um, uh, Madam uh, Laurie. Thank you, through the chair. I was just gonna say, I went through this exact process when I was in Springwater and um, I hear what Councillor Taylor is saying, but if you don't replace them all kind of similarly, then you'll have one community ask why they don't get a new nice sign and others do. So I have seen that complaint before. Uh, thank you. Um, I think uh, what uh, Derek is saying too is they'll do an inventory of all the signs that have to be replaced and start with the worst ones. And by the time you get to year four, uh, some of those that are looking fairly good now may uh, not look so good in four years time. But anyways, any other comments? Uh, seeing none, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the motion re oh, am I still muted? Um, You're good. The motion reads that administration report number A21-042 dated October 27th, 2021, with respect to a signage strategy and implementation plan be received and that staff be directed to move forward with the proposed signage plan and that the economic development reserve be used for signage and that staff be directed to continue to investigate funding opportunities to support signage implementation and that year one of the plan be considered by council in the 2022 budget deliberations. Thank you. Do we have a mover, please? That is uh, Member Stevens. Do we have a seconder? Member Cox. All in favor? That has passed, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving right along. Uh, we go to fireworks, uh, F5. Point three, and uh, Allison, is that uh, your bailiwick? That would be myself with the fire chief when he uh, needs to there chime in there. Um, so, council directed staff to look at options for fireworks regulations within the township, 
And based on some research, uh, you have the report before you. Staff at this time are comfortable recommending some regulations with respect to display fireworks. So these are the big ones you get at New Year's and things like that that are typically done by professional companies. Um, and to provide a fireworks ban during a fire, fire ban itself um, and to limit or restrict fireworks on township property. Um, outside of that, the other options are before you. So with respect to consumer fireworks, which are the ones that generated the report, they're the ones you can buy at your local convenience store, Canadian Tire or Lions Club tends to sell them as well, depending on where you are. Uh, so option one was to restrict consumer fireworks to only holiday weekends. Option two, um, prohibit the issuance of transient trader business licenses within seven for fireworks sales. We do have two licenses in 2020. Option three, total prohibition on consumer fireworks or option four, which is the status quo with no restrictions. So um, staff have made recommendation with respect to the display fireworks and what I would call some obvious points on during a fire ban in township property um, and leave it to council to provide us with direction on how they'd like to see us go elsewhere. Um, and the township does have limited complaints with respect to fireworks specifically this year, it seems to be has uh, been particularly from neighborhood, but uh, as noted in the report, they have the fire department has received limited queries and complaints um, and the OPP have only received 12 fireworks related occurrences this year. Um, so it's entirely up to council which way they want to go. Um, the large majority of municipalities that are putting fireworks in seem to focus in on holiday weekends. If council wants to target consumer fireworks at this point, um, and with that, we kind of leave it to council unless um, the chief has a couple comments he'd like to submit as well. Uh, chief Kearney? No, Allison has uh, done a good job on, on, um, on the report. So I have nothing further to add at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe we can get our act together someday, sometime on STRs. We may drop uh, some of our fireworks uh, complaints as well. But member uh, Taylor? Yeah, I threw the chair to Mr. Cranny and, or Allison. What would be the penalty for if you violate, say, option one? What's what's contemplated for that? Uh, uh, Allison? Thank you. So um, my prior municipality had uh, restrictions on fireworks to holiday weekends. Firework enforcement is a tricky thing um, because typically fireworks are let off when no one's around, right? They're let off in the wee hours of the evening. Um, often in order for them to proceed to court, we, or to proceed to a fine, um, we have to have neighbors who are willing to sign affidavits saying that they saw fireworks go off from this property at this time, because there's no way for us to get there from where we are in time to see them being set off. Um, normally, if we were to do, say, a dumping, we can see the property that the dumping has occurred at. We take pictures, we go from there. Um, the enforcement side of this would be set fines. Okay. So, writing. Okay. Right, someone's got okay. some. Okay. Okay. I don't know where that's coming from. I'm from Robinson. Hmm. Um, sorry about that. So by way of enforcement, it would be through set fines, but the trick with fireworks restrictions is always that, um, it, how do we ticket them if we're not there to see them? So some of this can be the OPP. They can also issue fines once the bylaws in place. Um, and in Tay, they were, they did probably a third of any fireworks um, fines that were, were actually managed to be laid. A Couple of times when fines were appealed, we ended up having to bring the neighbors with us to court because they were the ones that swore the affidavits that said that they witnessed the fireworks being set off. So um, fireworks are not an easy thing to administer uh, with respect to set fine enforcement, just because of the hours that they tend to occur at. So it's not the greatest answer, uh, Member Taylor, but it unfortunately is the puzzle that it is. Thank, thank you. Member Burkett, uh, did you have a comment? Thank you. Thank you through the chair. Uh, I'm struggling with this one only because of uh, the outcome. We haven't got an outcome from short term rentals and we have no way to enforce this to Madam Clerk's comments. And I'm not sure now 
if we shouldn't just leave it alone until we see what happens with the short-term rentals. Just my comment. Thank you very much, uh, Member Dunlop. So through the chair to Allison. I, I would agree with option four, no restrictions, but increased public awareness, like i.e. if it's a real dry weekend and we've got fire bans out anyway, that there's just a little plaque that slips on a keychain, you know, a chain underneath our fire ratings and just put ban fireworks, just put that on there. And that is a public awareness in itself. And then bring some, I don't know, Allison, through to you, if even when we get this short-term rental forward, if we can just ban short-term rentals in themselves, I don't know that. So I'm for option four. Uh, yes, Allison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just to uh, Member Dunlop's point, um, one thing that council can choose to do is just shelve all the options one to four until after the short-term rental matter comes back um, and then revisit it at that point if they so choose, um, depending on what avenue they choose to proceed with respect to short-term rentals. Um, staff very much do recommend though that some regulation with respect to permits for display fireworks. We only have two or three a year. Um, and the fireworks ban during a fire ban going to member Dunlop's point um, to support that, I'm gonna call it like a hanging banner um, and go from there, so. Uh, member Cox. I, uh, I agree with the, the recommendation that uh, we regulate display fireworks and provide a fireworks ban. I think part of the problem this time too was the pandemic and there were so many people at their cottages and they didn't really get to go out and they just wanted something to be happy about and do. So I, I will just say that I would go with, I mean, if it's option four or this recommendation, the chief's recommendation, I'm fine with it. We'll just leave it the way it is and, and you know make sure we do the safety precautions. Thank you very much, uh, Member Taylor. Yeah, through the chair to the chief, just to follow up. So do you have the little hanging signs that say fire ban? Because I think when we put the new, new signs in Ward 1, that was one of the uh, items that you were going to look at. So I think they should, if we don't, we should, and they should be on all the fire signs. Uh, yes, um, um, Tim Carini. Sorry. Um, through the chair, we already have the signs that say fire ban in effect. So we could add the uh, um, um, sign saying that fireworks are banned too. Um, it wouldn't be too much of an issue to add those. All right, thank you. Um, Member McIntyre, did you have a question? Yes. Uh, you're, uh, you're muted, uh, Member uh, McIntyre. How about now? I'm sorry. Yes. I just had a comment uh, through the chair. I, I agree that until we get the SAR straightened out, we really shouldn't do much of anything. We'd be circling back probably after this uh, short-term rentals or come to a conclusion and maybe undoing something we do now. So, uh, you know, I think maybe just leave it alone until we get that matter sorted out. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my own comments would echo uh, Mr. McIntyre's. Uh, I, I uh, believe we should solve the STR uh, problem first and then go from there. But um, anyone else like to comment? Uh, let's, uh, let's put up a motion, uh, Madam Clerk, uh, that indicates that uh, this will be taken for information purposes until such time as the issue of uh, STRs are uh, resolved. Uh, another comment from um, Member Cox and then Member Dunlop. Well, uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Chair, but I would uh, prefer that we just uh, pass the recommendation that the fire chief has given. Uh, Member Dunlop? So I like option four. It's just stay the status quo and add the, um, if it's if everything's really dry, which is what our years seem to be, that he just adds on a public awareness, like no fire fire ban, fireworks ban. It's it's just putting it out in the public. It's showing we're doing something, but we're not changing a lot until later. So I like option four. Thank you, um, uh, Madam Clerk. Yeah. yeah. So I can read a draft motion if you'd like. 
Yeah. And go from there. Okay. Um, so the motion read that administration report number A21-032 dated October 27th, 2021 regarding options for fireworks regulations be received. And the council opts for option for respecting consumer fireworks and further that a bylaw be brought forward to regulate display fireworks and provide for a fireworks ban during a fire ban. Uh, do we have a mover for that? Uh, Member uh, Cox, do we have a seconder? Member Dunlop, all in favor? That is passed, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there anything under F3? I don't see any. Uh, are we going to F5.1? Uh, I believe you're at uh, report F5.4 at this point, Mr. Chair. Yes, I, That's the uh, McClellan Road land sale inquiry. That's right. I did. My, my, my machine rolled back on me here. Okay. <laughs> Uh, F5.4, um, and uh, we have uh, a land sale on that, and uh, that is Allison, so please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so council received the initial inquiry report uh, back in August and directed that staff obtain an appraisal as to what the potential land parcels would be valued at um, and to report back. So those have now been uh, received. Uh, one thing that I should note to Council is that at no point does the Township own any land here that actually goes to water. Um, the piece that looks like a little V that runs down the side of the road um, does not actually intersect with the water and stops a little bit up when you actually pull the surveys and look at the mapping. So um, I just wanted to make sure that that was clear because that was um, a point that was seemed a little confused when the initial inquiry report came forward. So at this point, staff are recommending option B um, with respect to a land sale option for 43447 McClellan Road. Um, and that if council would approve the inquiry, then we would also approach the owners of 3443, which are the neighboring property owners, um, to purchase the piece that they're using as an access way in. Um, the driveway would, for both properties, um, one for 3443 would stay off McClellan Road and any future driveway for the corner lot would also come off McClellan Road. So those were the questions that council had. Um, the values are there in the staff report per the appraisal. Um, if council approves the land sale inquiry at this point based on option B, um, which is a smaller piece, up off McClellan Road and we would retain that triangle that comes down the side for the sake of a road shoulder. Um, then the next step would be having the pieces surveyed that would be going to 3447 and 3443 McClellan Road once we receive appropriate deposits from um, both purchasers. So. Thank you. You've heard the recommendation. Any further comments? Seeing none, uh, can we have that in the form of a motion, please? Certainly, Mr. Chair. So the motion reads that administration report number A21-038 dated October 27th, 2021 regarding additional information land sale inquiry 3447 McClellan Road be received and that the land sale inquiry be approved based on the proposed land division set out in map B for 3447 McClellan Road and further the staff inquired to the owners of 3443 McClellan Road to determine if they would like to purchase the lands between their property and McClellan Road. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, do we have a mover for that motion? Uh, that would be Member Stevens, a seconder. A seconder, one going once, going twice. Uh, Member Taylor, uh, all in favor. That has passed, Madam Clerk. Thank you very much. Now, we go to G, which is new business. And oh, I no, Mr. Chair, we've missed um, F5.8. Well, right point A, F, 5.5, I don't even have that on my agenda. You should, it's the Canine Enforcement and Kennel Services. It's 5.5. .5. I got that as 5.5. Oh, sorry, 5.5. .5. Okay. My, my agenda renumbered itself when I added all the motions for the uh, sign-in one. Okay, all right, uh, I'm to blame. 
Um, <laughs> and that is Allison again, please. Uh, thank you. So um, staff were prepared to proceed out with the standard RFP for our normal canine enforcement and kennel services back in August based on the current contract with the SPCA expiring. But when we reached out to the SPCA about the whole thing, they told us they were no longer going to be in the enforcement business, um, which came as a bit of a surprise. Turns out it's related to their change in mandate a couple of years ago. So you might remember that um, they came out a couple of years ago and said they will no longer be doing enforcement across the entirety of the province and the province has since put in their own um, canine enforcement things that deals with I'm going to say larger scale items um, and it's now up to the lower tiers to locate and find a new enforcement mechanism and process. Um, the SPCA is happy to provide kennel services which is great. So staff are bringing forward the option um, of maintaining our kennel service arrangement with the SPCA. So from a resident perspective it would look the same. If they find a dog running at large they can still take the dog in themselves. Um, or they can call the office and we'll deal with it as well. So this is from the public's perspective, the kenneling side will look exactly the same. Um, enforcement wise, the Township of Romero proved to be a fantastic partner this past summer with respect to enforcement in Washego. And they have had their own full in-house canine enforcement uh, for many, many years. They have full-time canine staff that operate all the time and they would be pleased to provide us with canine enforcement on an on-call basis which is how we operate as present as well um, with costs based on current expectation current expectations um, to be significantly less than our actual current spca contract so it would be a cost savings for us to proceed with the township of romero um, this went to their council before it came to ours because we wanted to make sure that their council would actually approve it um, so their council signed off on it last week. So if council is interested, then uh, staff are more than happy to recommend us having that working relationship with the Township of Romero. Um, township staff have built that relationship up substantially this past summer. Um, and John Popple and his staff are fantastic over there to deal with. So um, unless there's any questions, staff are recommending that we proceed with the SPCA for the Cannell service and the Township of Romero for enforcement. Thank you. Uh, any comments from committee? Uh, Member Cox. Oh, oh, I see you are ready for the vote. Okay. Uh, we'll put that in the form of a formal motion then? Certainly. Uh, so the motion reads that administration report A21-039 dated October 27, 2021 regarding canine enforcement and kennel services be received and that the Township of Severn enter into an agreement with the Township of Romero for the provision of canine enforcement, and that further the Township of Severn enter an agreement with the Ontario SPCA for kennel services, and further that the required bylaws be brought forward to the next regular council meeting. Thank you kindly. Do we have a mover for that motion? Uh, member Dunlop, seconder Member Stevens, all in favor? That uh, Madam Clerk has passed unanimously. Thank you. And I believe we're at new business. I don't know if council wants to take a second five minute stretch break or continue through. Do we need a break? No, no, okay, the answer is no. And okay. we're going back to the pulled items. Uh, no, we start, we have two items under new business first, uh, Mr. Chair. So G.1 right. and then G.2 and then we'll get to the two pulled items. Let's uh, hear from uh, Member uh, Dunlop with regard to G.1. Oh, uh, Member Burkett, uh, you had a question. Thank you, through the chair. I think it was me that asked, and I'll look to Member Dunlop if that's okay. That it was me to ask, that asked to uh, invite the- I'm okay with that, but I, through the chair, I'm okay with it, but I certainly don't have a problem contacting either one of them. I'd already gave a heads up to the MPP, so they can, pretty well come on Zoom meetings the same as we're doing right now. So you go ahead. Thank you, Member Dunlop. So just to the, the two issues that we're facing, uh, the containers that are that are in the waters that mm -hmm. Member Taylor is going to speak to uh, later and short-term rentals, uh, looking for some maybe guidance or bring them up to speed as to what actually is happening within our township. Good, good idea. Good idea. Uh, do we have any further comment? Uh, seeing none. Oh, yes, uh, Member uh, Cox. 
Yes, and I thought we were also going to mention to them about uh, the short-term rentals, but if they're going to come to a meeting, I guess we could talk to them and ask them if they could talk to their counterparts or their uh, peers in the rest of the province about the short-term rental issue, that it should be something that the province is looking at because of the fact that we're all doing the same thing, spinning our tires and spending money. Thank you. I think that's the uh, member Briquette's uh, yeah. uh, purpose of okay. the meeting is to do that. All okay. right, uh, do we have a motion, uh, Madam Clerk? Certainly. So the motion just reads that the local MP and MPP be invited to a future meeting to discuss and review matters impacting the Township of Severn. Thank you. Um, first, we'll go to uh, Laurie before we vote. Okay. I, I just wanted to be clear that the invitation will come from the clerk's office, and then if we need some help following up after, then that will be great. Thank you very kindly. That's protocol. Uh, do we have a mover for that motion? Uh, Stevens, uh, seconder, member Cox, all in favor? And Madam Clerk, that is passed. Thank you. <clears throat> and then we float down Georgian Bay with uh, Member Taylor. Uh, go ahead, Member Taylor, on your T2. Yeah, through the chair, I've sent in some uh, correspondence to in our package here, and basically, uh, uh, my opinion that these are, are floating potential environmental disasters here and rather than reading it in the paper I'd like to see so we all know as a group what's the latest like uh, has has the federal government banned these from from uh, federal water uh, can can the CEO bring us up to date with everything that she knows and just so we know all know as a group um, what's going on and we have to do whatever we can do as a township to stop these things. Uh, I heard a, a rumor that they couldn't go through Lock 45 to get into Georgian Bay, which means if they're built on our side, they're going to stay in Gloucester Pool and and uh, inhabit it, Crown land and federal waters in our township. So that's what I'm. I'm just trying to get an update. Who can bring us up to speed on what's going on with? Uh, with these floating disasters. Thank, thank you, uh, Member Taylor. And as I understand it, this is on the Georgian Bay side, not our side, but uh, Member Briquette, you're gonna shed some light on that? Thank you, through the chair I am. So I reached out to our new MP and explained uh, this is one of our uh, top concerns and I would, I would reach out to him later with some other concerns that we had. So he got back to me with an email and I'll just read it for everyone. It was too late to put on an agenda, but I'll read what he emailed me. Issue with floating structures. Our office has reached out to Parks Canada and Transport Canada to get more information on whether, I'm not sure what that means, E-X-I-T-I-N-S, actins, I'm not, maybe it's a spelling mistake. Or is that, no, it says E-X-I-T-I-N-S, orders, and orders oh. is after it. It must be a spelling error. Will be enforced or whether these might be classified as a, ves as a vessel. Our neighboring MP, Scott Atkinson, is also involved and we will work together to get us answers from federal agencies. Once we get feedback from our contacts, I recommend a small meeting with our three levels to discuss options and potential actual action plans. Thank you, I appreciate that. Any further follow-up comments, uh, Member Taylor? Yeah, I'd certainly like to be involved in that meeting, but uh, can the CAO comment on her dialogue with Georgian Bay? Um, uh, Madam CAO? I don't have any more information than the mayor gave. I think uh, Georgian Bay is standing by and waiting for Transfer Canada and Parks Canada to deal with the issue. They don't have any authority in the current issue. Good. Okay. Uh, any further comment? Seeing none, do we have a motion, Madam Clerk? Oh, uh, Member Burkett. Thank you through the chair to member Taylor. I know that you've been inundated with calls, but I think member Taylor for your benefit, I would pass, like that's why we have our MP there. 
I would pass those, like pass the the residents' concerns on to our MP until we actually get some sort of uh, guidance as to which way we need to go with this. Uh, Member Taylor. Yeah, you, you had mentioned there that he's the, the, he's uh, recommending a meeting with all three levels, and and uh, I belong to one of the levels. No. Yeah, I think uh, what. Uh, Member Burkett might be saying is that if we inundate them with the complaints that we're getting, they may see the severity of this issue and uh, what we're dealing with. Member Burkett. Thank you, through the chair. Absolutely. Like rather than you taking the brunt, brunt of this, Member Taylor, that's what our MP is, is there for. And absolutely, when he reaches back out to me stating that he now has some guidance from Transport mm -hmm. Canada, I will include you. But until that such time, he needs to realize the amount of people that are struggling with this. So I would forward any of your concerns to his office, please. Thank you. Uh, Member Dunlop. So through the chair, um, the Gloucester Pool Cottage Association asked me about um, how they could get a hold of uh, our, MPP, our MP. I've directed them and he has gotten back to the Cottage Association. So. Um, like Member Burkett had just said, just keep sending them to, to Adam. And when we have a meeting with something, I think it should involve all the council because we all have waterways around us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Madam Clerk, do we have a motion to that effect, please? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So at this time, the motion is fairly simple that the correspondence and floating container cottages be received for information and provided to our local MP. Uh, Member Taylor. Well, wouldn't it be appropriate at this point to send something official from all of council to our new MP that we, to, to maybe get in writing what, what uh, the mayor said? Let's get all of council involved in this. Um, all right. And any comment? And you, yes, um, CAO Laurie. Thank you. Through the chair, we did send a letter from the mayor um, to the past MP. MP. Uh, we could resend it to the current one. Just I, I know that uh, the former MP shared it, but we could resend it. It outlined all of our environmental concerns. Thank you, um, Member Dunlop. So through the chair, um, when I spoke to our to our MP Adam. He said, because they were so long getting into their offices, they were almost two months backed up on phone calls and emails. So I don't think it would hurt to resend one now because he says they are getting caught up, but it doesn't hurt to have another one in front of them. Good, good point. Thank you, uh, Member Dunlop. Um, uh, Madam Clerk, do we have a motion, please? Uh, certainly that the correspondence on floating container cottages be received for information and provided to our local MP and that the prior correspondence previously sent uh, be resent to the new local MP. Thank you very kindly. Do we have a mover on that? Uh, Member Taylor, uh, and do we have a seconder? Member McIntyre, all in favor? And that has passed unanimously. Okay, and I believe now we're on to the two poll items. Okay, uh, the first one, Madam Clerk, that was pulled? That is D1.6. That is on the uh, Gypsy Moss. Thank you. And uh, who is speaking? Did you pull that, uh, Member Taylor? Okay, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, just to re reiterate, uh, back in the summer here, um, several areas of, of Ward 1, i.e. Uh, Georgian Heights overlooking Match Dash Bay, McLean Lake, Gloucester Pool, sections of Upper Big Chute Road. And I still believe that if uh, if you didn't see the damage that these uh, insects have done, it's unbelievable. And uh, um, I looked at the tiny township webpage and they did a, they had uh, a survey, people could go in and put in a survey saying, what would you like to do? Um, are you willing to pay money towards something? And uh, uh, I know pretty much all of Gloucester Pool uh, have signed, there's a huge people in favor of the township trying to do something to help Gloucester Pool out. So has the township considered doing a, an online survey just to see if 
people, if, if we could do something like maybe look, review what Tiny Township did, if we can do something like that, I think we should try and do something for our, our taxpayers because they it's uh, just a devastating thing. And like I say, unless it has happened to you, you don't see it because even I witnessed it on my property, uh, the oak trees and maple trees were defoliated, but the leaves came back, but the spruce trees got wiped out and they're not coming back. So I lost about half of my trees going up my driveway due to the gypsy moth. Okay, thank you for that. Member Burkett. Thank you through the chair to member uh, Taylor. When you said tiny and, and they were willing to pay for it, were the residents themselves that were going to have the spraying done willing to pay for it or was it everyone in the township that would have to pay for it? No, no it was a survey that the township put out to, to ask different questions to see what, what the people were looking for and what what they could look at different options. But we, I don't think we as a township have done anything to see if there's any options at all out there, if there are any. Um, uh, I'm wondering, is uh, Mr. Burke online? Yes. There he is. Okay. Well, can we have your comment, please? For, for sure. So the Public Works Department has been also monitoring the effects of gypsy moth, and uh, we have collaborated with the County of Simcoe, their forestry group, as you know, a, a key stakeholder and a large uh, landowner uh, that would be impacted by the gypsy moss, the uh, the county Sim Simcoe County Forest. Mm -hmm. And all indicate that while the BTK um, application, uh, an aerial spray basically, uh, to control um, the outbreak of this moth may work. It may not be as effective as, as one would think. And, uh, and further, the population count that I remember Graham mentioning to me indicates a decline already in, the, in, the partic in this particular cycle. So staff at this time and back in August have recommended that we do not engage in a municipal BTK spraying program. Uh, we are free to, to offer some resources uh, to the public and, and SSEA as our partner in environmental management stewardship um, has already provided that guidance that there, there are BTK um, uh, applicators that private property owners can retain, um, but uh, the, the, the cost of which is not a municipal cost uh, or is not recommended to be at a staff level. Uh, Derek, one question I have for you. Uh, do we know in the cycle where we are with gypsy moth? I'd heard that perhaps we have one more year on this. Do you, can you shed any information on that? Yeah, through the chair. The, the Public Works Department is definitely not the experts in this particular uh, one, but the, the report provided by SSEA and followed up by the numbers uh, measured from the fall do indicate a decline in this particular cycle. So um, that's that's all the information I really have uh, to share, but we can share that uh, you know to committee um, through the resources we have with SSEA. Thank you. Uh, Member Dunlop. So through the chair, I know at Simcoe County, they decided not to do anything, but the Simcoe County forests are not heavy in spruce. They're heavy in oak and maple, and they did come back. And they said there is a decline, but there's always a but in there. If it's a nice, warm, dry spring like it was this year, those gypsy moths or LLD will be back. And they do decline because they kill themselves out. But if we lose as many spruce next year as we did this year, it's going to be a sad look. I would like us to. I know there's that Zimmer Air that does the spray. They have to do it twice and it's in a very small time period and it's very expensive. So if Severin Sound has something that we could suggest to our residents that they may be able to use on a small case, like somebody that's got five or 10 acres or something, it wouldn't be feasible for them. Um, I know Tiny's said you could spray yourself if you were a resident or you'd have somebody spray, but you had to sign an agreement that it wouldn't go on your neighbor's property and it wouldn't touch township property. But I'd still like to know if there's somebody like, uh, one girl suggested at the county, like the cooperators, they have those big land sprayers. If something like that would be available to uh, people that have a larger lot, I'm looking into myself just to getting my own sprayed here. And also that spray they talk about and they say, well, it's gonna kill all the, all the caterpillars, everything's going to go. And they also said, that's not true. Um, and birds, instead of having four eggs, might have two. And 
the caterpillars, instead of having 100, we might have 95. So this, this material they use comes right out of our ground. So there's options, but it's expensive. But again, if our township could supply on our website through Severn Sound options, I'd really appreciate that. Uh, Member Burkett. So well, through the chair, so thank you, uh, Member Dunlop. That's a, that's a great idea. I'm not in favor of, of uh, spraying or, or just having something on our website, giving our residents guidance as to what they may or may not be able to do is something I would be in favor of. Thank you. Any further comments? Uh, Member Taylor. Yeah, I would echo what uh, Member Dunlop said. I think if the county had more spruce trees, they might pay more attention to, to the damage here. Uh, Member Burkett. Um, through the chair, just to let you know, the county has an abundance of spruce trees. There's 33,000 acres we're talking about. It isn't all hardwood. There's tracks and thousands of tracks of, of uh, spruce and pine, thousands. Uh, Member Cox. The, I have them and they got mine, but mine came back. And the, uh, the ones I know other people the uh, arborist said, leave them alone. It might take a year, it might take two, but they could come back. Uh, member Dunlop. So when three that I had that cost me close to a thousand dollars to take down, when I talked to the forester, Graham at the county, he said, if they're dead, they're dead. They are not coming back. I'm sitting here right now looking at four that are very iffy. I don't think they're coming back. The tops are brown, but the as far as the county, Graham told me they're not heavy in spruce, so they're not concerned. They're more concerned about the maple and the oak, and they think they're fine. And I have scraped egg masses off my trees. You can YouTube it and find out how to do it, but there's some hanging over Woodrow Road, and the whole branch over the road is solid egg mass. I was going to ask our Derek Burke if they would cut that run branch down, but we can talk about that later. Uh, Member Taylor, did you have a further comment? Yeah, I just, uh, I've said my bit about the county is saying unless it happens to them, they they don't pay attention to us, but we are scraping uh, egg masses off our trees as well. Uh, Allison, do we have a motion, please? Uh, so I think I followed where council wants to go on this one at this time. So um, what I have is that public works report number W21-033, dated August 25th. 2021 with respect to LDD moth control aerial spray program be received as information and that staff provide information on the township's website as to what may be done by property owners. Thank you very much. Do we have a, a, a mover for that? Um, wrong card. Member Cox, do we have a seconder? Uh, seconder, yes. Member Stevens, all in favor? That is passed. Okay, we are on to the abeyance list. Uh, no, uh, Mr. Chair, we're on to the poppy campaign item. Well, there I am jumping again, poppies. <laughs> and I believe two members had a declaration on this one. Yes, right, right. Uh, who wishes to speak to this first? And Member Dunlop. Thank you. Through the chair, um, as we all know, the legions do amazing uh, things for our communities, right from supporting uh, figure skaters and hockey players, right up to the legions programs with veterans. And I whole, whole, wholeheartedly support that we give money to their poppy fund. I don't see a mount in their uh, letter. They're just telling us all the good things they do. And we do, we do know they do. And uh, so I don't know, Allison, was there a past amount that we used? No, no, it's entirely up to council to pick however much they'd like to. You don't, what did we give last year? Uh, perhaps the treasurer could help me out on that one. Okay, well, the treasurer's looking that up. I wanna comment on their um, lawn signs this year. They're $20, they're sold out in cold water, but they're a beautiful, just says, lest we forget, and it's got beautiful poppies on it. And I asked them if that was, if they were not gonna do the poppies this year. And they said, no, that was just another event. So they've done well from that and congratulations for them and the people that have put them out. I love mine. 
Can't Thank say you. enough about it. Thank you. Uh, Member Taylor? Yeah, I think while well, Andrew's looking that up, I, I know we always buy a wreath anyway as a minimum from the township, right? So I, I'd be in favor of donating something as well. That's not, uh, you're not suggesting or requesting that to budget. You're, you're seeing uh, what we want to do right now. Yeah. So, Member McIntyre. Through the chair to uh, all, um, there are 400 branches of the Royal Canadian Legion in Ontario, uh, roughly 100,000 members, and the amount of good work that they do is uh, it's immeasurable. Um, whatever we conclude here in terms of a donation to the Legion, it probably wouldn't be enough, but I'd be in favor of certainly giving a donation to the Legion. Thank you very much. Um, Andrew Plunkett. If I can, uh, Mr. Chair, it looks like we gave them $500 last year. Uh, Member Dunlop. So Andrew, uh, thank you. Through the chair, Andrew, does that just come out of our grant money that we've got still left? Uh, yes, we can apply it there. I believe there's enough room for us to still uh, apply that grant there. Perfect. So I would like a motion then saying that the Township of Severn supports $500 donation towards the Poppy Fund for the Co-Wire Legion. M Madam Chair. I uh, understand that uh, we, we, we spring these things on you and expect uh, 200 words a minute, and uh, that's not fair, but do, take your time. <laughs> there we go, all done. I'm close to that, but not that close. So, oh. um, okay, so the motion reads that the Township of Severn provide a grant in the amount of $500 to the Royal Canadian Legion Poppy Remembrance Campaign. And um, Madam... Uh, Dunlop is going to uh, give that motion. The second is going to be Member Taylor. All in favor? Perfect. That is passed. Okay. Um, I believe we're at member updates now, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, all right. When do we go? Back to, are you talking? Okay, we've, we've done the, uh, okay. Uh, member updates. Let's start in uh, Ward 1 and uh, come across, please. Are you there? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, villages and Hamlets, we've met a few times, and uh, I think as of uh, this morning, we've uh, approved the final uh, artwork for the mural in Port Severn. So stay tuned with that. I think it all looks looks great. And I guess from the looks of it, it's going to be put up this year. Uh, Water Mill, we had uh, our AGM on October the 7th. Uh, thanks for Jane and Judith for attending. And, and I know Mike couldn't make it. It was late at night and he had to cross the uh, Severn River. But uh, thanks for calling in for that, Mike. Uh, and the mill is looking forward to the uh, Sluiceway project under Mill Street to get it uh, up and done and hopefully stop our water problems in the mill. And uh, we're still planning a grand opening of the upstairs in June of 2022, uh, COVID permitting. Uh, Seg Bay uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, we had an in-person meeting in Port Severn yesterday. And I, I don't know if you saw the, the news flash that came out, but the summary of the golf tournament held in September, it made $31,500. Uh, 21,000 is going to the Georgian Bay hospitals for defibrillators and 10,500 goes to WENDAT. So uh, over eight years, Fred Waring has, uh, through his gui uh, guidance on this uh, golf tournament, has raised over $260,000. So good for him. Uh, Matchinash Community Heritage Center, we're having our first in-person meeting in way over a year. So that's going to be tonight. Good. Thank you very much. Ward two. Um, we had our Lake Country AGM on October 18th. Um, they talked about all the photo photos and videos um, on Severin that they done with um, with Lake Country and with Severin. Um, there's uh, 
one video called Close to Home. It's a correlation of Bruce County and Simcoe working together and they are collaborating on a lot of things now. It's much better to try to get your tourists in together than to you know. We're ramping up our social media. Um, the RTO7 is uh, holding a, a tipsy, it's called. It's a customer service training for free for um, all our tourism things. Catherine Stevenson was there from the county with a ton of different um, things that are going on in the county, the motorcycle route, which Coldwater is part of, the Butter Tart and Bikes route, the Culinary Tourism Alliance, and um, Lake Country is also doing a strategic plan that they got a grant from the county for, uh, and it's $1,700. Um, there's a new downtown program. Then we had, uh, we had our OHT meeting, and uh, that's the uh, Ontario Hospital Table, I mean Ontario Hospital, um, Kuching Hospital Table meeting, and we're working on the frail and the geriatric. It's down to the point that we're pretty well have one, if you go into the hospital with a frail senior, there's one form you fill out, and it covers everything for them. So within 24 hours, you have every single thing they need, and they've all been advised. It's all electronic. The next one is mental health, and then palliative care is, is next. Um, the home care has been enhanced services. They're utilizing it a lot because that helps keep seniors at home instead of having to go into nursing homes. Uh, yesterday at the chamber, Santa is coming to Aurelia. It's called the Santa Tour. They're also having light up Aurelia uh, and a food drive. And the, um, the thing is, let's shop local. I choose to shop local is the chamber right across Ontario. And they're all collaborating again. They used to have, please come to Barrie, please come to Rulia. Now they're saying for Simcoe County, let's just stay in Simcoe County, shop local and try not to do so much um, online. We're going to have the um, Achievement Awards in March, April. We're planning on having all the uh, candidates put in videos like they did last year. So right now we're still going with virtual, but if it works out, then we will be having a uh, in-person one, hopefully. And I'm also now on the Aurelia Sustainability Committee. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Uh, and in light of uh, uh, time, I'm just going to give you the Reader's Digest for three. Um, the uh, uh, Otis Park is uh, roof repairs have been made, and they're still struggling with how uh, they're going to pay for that. But it's a, a legal issue, not a financial one. So uh, that is, is fine. Uh, Mayor uh, Dunlop, or Mayor uh, Burkett, uh, would you uh, re put this down, please? We've been requested, you and I, to attend after our budget meeting on November the 26th. They are having a fundraiser at um, uh, the Eclectic uh, Cafe dinner for all the new docks in our area over this last year to make to socially welcome them into the group. And uh, since we uh, have in Coldwater uh, put in two uh, new doctors and new nurse coming in, uh, our, our presence has been specifically requested. Um, I, and uh, the tickets are going to be 100 or 140, something like that. Uh, we, it is not for sure yet. I will tee that up with you when we get the number of doctors. It's 10 family doctors, one specialist, uh, for 11, we're counting in their spouses, which is 22, and they have another 10 uh, tickets for politicians and those that are supporting them. So if you uh, just can record that, I will firm that up with you as soon as I hear that it's a go, and uh, hopefully the budget meeting on that day won't go till six o'clock and we can attend. Uh, Mayor Burkett. Thank you, uh, through, through you. Um, Please secure me a ticket. I, I want to go, John. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Thank you. I will do that. And uh, it, like I say, they haven't surveyed all the docs yet to make it a go situation. But as soon as I hear that, I'll I'll let you know. Uh, that's all I'm going to report on uh, at, for this Ward Four. 
Yes. Now uh, you need to unmute yourself, Ron. There. Uh, you're muted again, Ron. You have to hold the space bar down, Councillor Stevens. How's that? Yeah. Is that better? Go I'm on my stand, I'm unmuted. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I had two SSA meetings last month, and I had two library board meetings as well uh, to do with finances and just to re uh, bring our new uh, uh, librarian in to focus on uh, how things are done. And she seems quite happy with the pro whole process, so we're happy for her. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ward Five. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, we have Canal Road and Cambrian Roads have been paved, turned into Indianapolis Speedway. They're now that they're still <laughs> at, we'll have to, to have a word with Mr. Burke about that. Uh, the rink in Wachego is magnificent. The uh, the reover, the redo that they've done on it is uh, terrific. I encourage everybody to go out and have a look at that. Um, they've done a great job on that. Um, the property standards, uh, I think, through the clerk, have been out to um, two properties in the community over the last little while, and they've uh, sorted them out and enhanced the beauty of the. One particularly in downtown um, Wichego, which makes um, the place look um, really nice. Now it really cleans up the village, and um, that's just about all I got for Ward Five. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Mayor Dunlop. Thank you, through the chair, uh, Member Taylor covered the village and hamlets. We've been working hard on that mural, and it was approved last night. Uh, Jim, Mark, and I are on that committee, and it looks wonderful. The girl that painted it is an amazing artist. Uh, BIA, we had our AGM at the back of the mail. It was well attended. Uh, since then, we have passed our BIA budget. I'm excited to have a new member on board called Sharon Reynolds, and she has joined me on beautification, which I'm very grateful for. Uh, we're getting plans underway for the Christmas decorating. Uh, Sovereign Library Board met on October the 4th. Uh, to date, September 30th, the township has paid memberships to the City of Aurelia in the sum of $28,350. Members of Severin, active right now, are 795, and in the month of September, 795 people only took out 289 uh, books or whatever they were checking out. So. Although we've got that many patrons, they're not using the library that we're paying $45 a person for. We have seven new patrons in, in Severin joined in September and one from Mara Madonte. Dee sent us out an email yesterday to say the library's opened once again, but if people don't feel safe there, they can still do curbside pickup. She's quite willing to do that. The only thing we're not gonna do is open the computers up for people to come because you're still sitting too close. The library has continued throughout this whole COVID to have good um, checkouts and it's, it's up there. People are really wanting to get back inside so they can browse. Uh, Dee can now set up some of her programs that she's interested in getting going, but they will be on hold too until everything looks a lot better. Um, now that we're on YouTube, I would bring up again that I sit on a committee at County called Communities and it's with Soldiers Memorial Hospital. The CAO, uh, Carmen asked during the last meeting what we could do to get more shots in arms. I had seen on TV the night before the back bus was in Midland and Penetang machine. So I suggested that they were all over it. The vaccination bus is coming to Coldwater Foodland on November the 7th, 10 to four, and it will be in Wishago in front of the old log cabin, but on township property. And that will be November the 17th, 10 to three. And they have also said that they would come back around for the second shots if people didn't want to go into shoppers. Uh, at the county yesterday, we talked about DCs. Uh, they're very important uh, development charges uh, to build new infrastructure for all the new um, future needs that we have to support. Our big um, meeting yesterday was on garbage. It was brought up and it was on the news before our meeting was even done that 18 supported it and 12 didn't. 
And actually it was kind of um, ironic that the mayor of Tay said, don't do a recorded vote because it's gonna make the rest of us look like we're not supporting an exchange of your carts. But option B also had that exchange. So um, I won't speak for Mayor Bur Burkett, but um, I know he was in favor of option B and that was exchange of carts also. So he can talk about that later. Um, then they had talked about only seniors or those with disabilities could exchange their carts. And that wasn't fair because there's a lot of people under 65 that have problems moving carts. So you can, uh, ask for a exchange a cart and it'll be on their website that you can go on or you can call service Simcoe and do that. But that isn't gonna happen until they hoped at the earliest, the end of February, but that's kind of iffy too. Um, for $3.9 million. Yeah, this was, sorry it happened guys. We, uh, but we're gonna correct it, okay? I'm, I can't say anything about it. Um, I guess that's it. That's all. Thank you very much. Uh, Member Briquette. There we go. Thank you through the chair. So just to uh, carry on from Member Dunlop's comments, the development charges are going to go up 45%. So now it will be $14,500. So what they did was they gave comparables across Ontario. I, I think if I can remember, Toronto pays like $90,000. Like I just can't fathom. Anyways, um, they've increased it. So my time there at the county, my last uh, 11 years, from zero development charges to the point now we're at 14500 I was invited to the grand opening of our new OPP station, which is just in front of Rotary Place. Uh, it was a $20 million uh, building, 163 employees. It's the largest one in Ontario. Minister Dunlop, Minister Jones, and Commissioner Carrot were all present. Uh, I was thankful for the invite. Just to add to the options about waste, uh, man, the waste meeting we had yesterday, it started at nine, we didn't finish until 5.30. People, and, I, and someone did ask that they communicate the, the decision fairly so that all our residents understood what was going on. But option B basically stated that we were yes in favor of a smaller cart, but let's wait, let's give it six months and let's see and do a survey and come back with, with some actual hard facts. County Council didn't see it that way. 18 voted in favor of, of producing those uh, smaller carts at a cost. So the cost is anywhere from 1 million to 3.9 million, as you stated, um, Chair. And of course, ongoing costs of a of million dollars per year and added staff and added uh, trucks. So. Those were my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, Member Dunlop. I, thank you, through the chair. I just want to, I don't want to go on about the garbage, but they did a pilot project down in Nottawasaga, all those uh, townhouses in there. So they've already given them the smaller carts and said, you know, this is for you guys. We're going to do this pilot project. Those people have already started calling back in, we need a bigger cart. So like Member Briquette said, the option that Mike and I would have liked was to give people six months and say, maybe you're, maybe you're getting more garbage than you thought you had. But anyway, it was turned down. I still agree that people can exchange carts, but uh, work with the one you've got for now, folks, please. Uh, Member Taylor. Just a question in our area. What about any comments on the bear proof bins and what about the, uh, the roads that get closed in the winter time for a communal garbage spot. Member Dunlop. I'll speak to the bear bins. Member Burkett can speak to the roads. Um, the bear bins, I'd ask if they could have a pilot project on a road off the tower line. Uh, just give us one bear bin. And they all knew up there that if there's smelly garbage in there, it's not supposed to be in there. You're supposed to compost, recycle. Your garbage should not smell. So they they didn't go with that pilot project, but they are gonna supply bear bins if 
I put my garbage out and the bears have totally destroyed that bin. I call the township or the county. They come out and say, well, look what you've got in here. And they will only give a bear bin out if it's proved that your garbage was not smelly. And a cup, well, I had one county councillor speak not favorably upon it, but it had gone on so long that day, I couldn't describe that those people are backing onto crown land. There's campers out there that leave garbage. They attract the bears. When the bear's not getting enough there, they go to these cottage home owners adjacent to them. But anyway, there are bear bins. They have to prove that it was a bear that wasn't just after food. So there will be a bear bin program, but they are expensive and they're not just gonna start handing them out to everybody. So all I've got to say about that. Thank you, thank you. Let's move on. Um, Madam CAO, your report, please. Thank you. Um, two quick things. One, just to follow up on the deputy mayor's uh, VAX bus. One of the reasons that it was driven is Severn is getting reported as having the lowest vaccine rate in in Simcoe, Muskoka. And I just wanted to update council to say that's not entirely accurate. Um, so it's great to have the bus and it's great to encourage all the vaccines that we can. Um, the picture isn't entirely fair though. Um, the vaccines are tracked on postal codes and postal codes don't follow municipal borders. So um, for instance, the cold water postal code is being allocated to Oro um, and there are some other boundaries. I did ask the health unit to look into that and they said if they gave us back the, the cold water postal code, it would show our vaccine rate at 130% of our population, which doesn't make sense either. So it's not perfect. Um, they did an analysis for me to show it based on LINs. So we would be in the Kuchiching LIN. And in fact, the Kuchiching LIN has about the same rate as all of the other LINs. In fact, when you do it by LINs, South Simcoe is is the lowest on the list, which I pointed out to uh, the health unit to say that's actually where your higher infections are too. So maybe you want to publicize that a little bit more. But to be fair, it's not their number one uh, uh, project to look at and they're probably not going to fix it. And there probably isn't a fix because people's health codes are driven by postal codes. But I just wanted, if you're getting any resident feedback to say, why are we the lowest? It's not an accurate number. So I just wanted to let council know that. Um, the second thing is the Aurelia land use study. So I forwarded uh, to council last week their first study and I did watch the tape of their meeting and a couple of things just to update council on. One, the, they've started with a very large area compared to what they need. So um, I think the study is looking at 14,000 hectares and they need either 360 or 380. So it'll come down quite a bit um, when they study. But two is just to assure you, it's a really long and public process. So they're at the very infancy stage to identify what they need and they have to go through this study, which looks like it'll take a year or more. And then when they settle on what they're looking for, then if they would have to um, embark on an annexation process, which also takes a, quite a bit of time. So nothing's gonna happen today or tomorrow and we will keep you updated as it goes, but uh, very early days yet. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, um, we uh, need to go to closed session now, as I understand it. And uh, do we have a motion to that effect? We do. So the motion reads that committee resolve in a closed session and that the meeting is hereby now closed to the public pursuant to the Municipal Act, SO 2001, Chapter 25, Section 239.2, for the purpose of considering a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition land by the municipality or local board. Thank you very much. We have a mover. Um, member Dunlop, uh, second. Member Taylor, all in favor? Uh, that is passed. Uh, Shall we proceed? Uh, uh, do, do you you have to?
So the motion reads that closed session adjourn at 1235 p.m. and that the meeting is now hereby reopened to the public. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, yes. Uh, remember I thought you needed, I thought you needed a, mo a movement on that in a second. I do. Okay, we have a uh, member McIntyre moved it and member Cox seconded. it. All in favor? We are now out of closed session. Thank um, you. Then what we need is the motion that uh, you need to read now. Yes, so the motion reads that verbal that the verbal report from the Director of Public Works be received and that council endorses the land acquisitions and that staff proceed with offers of purchase and sale. We have a mover, please. Uh, member Taylor, the seconder, member uh, Dunlop, all in favor? That has passed. Uh, and I guess the next one is a motion for adjourn. It is. Simple motion that this meeting be in its here mile by adjourned at 12.36. Member McIntyre, second by Member Taylor, all in favor? And if I don't get a break soon, we're going to have a flood. Thank you. And uh, enjoy your day. Thank you very much. Oh, wait. Oh, is, yeah. is Lynn still around, Lori? I think she dropped.